Good morning and welcome to our second FY 2024 operating budget work session. Today we will continue to review the superintendent's proposed operating budget covering chapters two through six. Our next work session on the operating budget chapters will be held on Tuesday, January 24th, 2023 at 10 a.m. The board is scheduled to take tentative action on the operating budget at the February 23rd, 2023 business meeting. As we go through today's budget chapters, I urge staff to point out pertinent issues that may be of concern to the board. As always, board members are free to ask questions at any point during the presentation and request staff to provide information on specific issues. Uh, let's start by having our board members introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Kim. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Brenda Wolf. Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday, Grace Rivera Oven. Good morning, Julie Yang, District 3. And you can see I am wearing something a little bit different today. Uh, this is in celebration of the Luna New Year, the Year of the Rabbit. Thank you, and I'm Carla Silvestri. Dr. Wing Knight, do you have any comments before we begin? No. No? Okay. So um, let's get started. We are looking forward to the conversation, as always, in our efforts as board members to understand the budget so that we can um, ask our questions, do our due diligence, mm -hmm. and um, you know, just continuously work towards the betterment of our students. Dr. Okay. McKnight. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, long time no see. <laughs> Last night we had a uh, budget hearing and, and uh, it's always good to be able to have our work sessions and in between our work sessions to be able to hear from our community members to process their uh, reactions to what they understand in the budget and the things that they um, you know, want to continue to engage in understanding around. And today is yet again another opportunity for us to delve in a little bit deeper. And so I'm excited that our families and as well as you as board members will be able to dig in at the next level with us today. So uh, today we're holding the second of three operating budget work sessions on my recommended budget for fiscal year 24. Um, our first work session held was last Tuesday, and so it was last Tuesday in which we spent time focusing on one chapter, which was chapter one, chapter one being uh, one that represents more than half of our operating budget because that chapter was focused on schools, <coughs> generally. Um, this morning we're going to focus on chapters two through six. Um, so we will have a number of chapters that we're going to go through um, in the operating budget, and these five chapters are going to represent school support and well-being and academic leadership components within MCPS. So that's going to be the, the stage of what we're going to discuss today in those chapters. At the first work session, I explained that we would discuss accelerators in our third budget work session, um, which will be held on January 24th. Uh, and so we plan to address not just the what, but how and why these accelerators are going to be needed this year specifically. So as we engage in discussion today, know that there may be some things that come to mind around some accelerators that you know we've already introduced in the budget, but we will have a chance to circle back and dig into that uh, deeper. Just wanted to remind you of that. Um, and just as important, we want to discuss the expected outcomes for the accelerators. I talked a little bit about that last night, um, uh, just on the surface at the hearing. But as we present the accelerators, we want to continue to share, and we'll be able to do this at our next budget work session, how it's building. The budget really is a process that we have to build on. We know what we need. We know what we needed last year. We know what we need now. And in some cases, we can project what are going to be some core concepts that we want to focus on for next year. Um, and so we want to be able to lay that out for you. And as we lay that out, really focus on um, what the outcomes were. What were we able to achieve as a result of the investments last year? What do we expect to achieve as a result of the accelerators that we're presenting this year um, to make sure that we're showing and sharing our levels of accountability around uh, the things that we funded in our budget thus far? So um, I look forward to us having a very thoughtful and deep discussion about the budget. Thank you so much for all of your engagement. At this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hull, our Chief Operating Officer. 
Great. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Uh, members of the board, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so since we met last, um, we had our hearing last night, the second hearing on the operating budget. And so it was really great to hear the input from our communities, uh, some of their priorities, where they would like us to focus. We've also been engaging our community throughout this process. So from the very beginning, we've engaged the Budget Advisory Committee, um, along with our association partners, uh, the board, and numerous other um, the, the public budget uh, works, or I mean, um, presentations that we did. And so we've really made an effort to, to get out and uh, hear from our community what their priorities are. And as you've heard, uh, there's a lot of them. And there's a lot of competing priorities. Uh, and there's limited resources. So uh, the budget team, the finance team, has done a great job of really taking all of that back and trying to distill it down based on this board's priorities to really identify the highest leverage investments that we feel are going to move the needle for our students. And so you know, we are excited to be here today to uh, lay out uh, five more chapters uh, for you all to look at and then answer any questions that you have so that hopefully you walk away with a thorough understanding of what's in the budget, um, your questions are answered, and, and, um, and you feel uh, that you have everything you need uh, to make your recommend, recommended budget to the county council. So um, I will kick us off here, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. All right, so uh, as President Silvestre noted, uh, today we are going to go through chapters two through six. And so this includes um, school support and well being, curriculum and instructional programs, special education, and strategic initiatives in technology. And so last time we looked at the schools, but I mentioned that there are many, many other resources and programs outside of chapter one that are also within the schools and focus directly on uh, student achievement. So those are the chapters we're going to focus on today. Uh, then in the next work session, uh, we will focus on some of the more operational pieces, so district operations, human capital, finance, uh, and then again the uh, accelerators will be discussed at our next meeting. If we go to the next slide, please. So this is the same um, slide that we saw last time, but just kind of grounding us again in the board's priorities. And once again, you'll see these icons noted throughout the presentation, identifying where there is connections to one of these four priorities. So uh, building safe uh, and inclusive school climate, um, improving math and literacy rates, improving retention and recruitment of staff, and supporting two-way communications with our staff, with our families, and with our communities. And so look for those icons on the bottom right of the slides as we work through, and that's where we've identified uh, the alignment. Uh, so I will pause there and turn it over to Mr. Riley and um, let him take it from here. Next slide, please. Good morning, Dr. McKnight, uh, board members. So a little more reflection on what we heard last night. Uh, so I heard a lot of testimony focused on investing in items that show results. So in the business world, this is what is known as return on investment, or ROI. So when faced with limited resources and a variety of potential projects, the business executive will determine which project provides the most earnings for the amount invested for their shareholders. In essence, this is what we're doing in MCPS as well. Current school finance literature is referring to this as the academic return on investments, or AROI. However, we aren't doing this for shareholders. <clears throat> We're doing this for all of our stakeholders, which is our 160,000 students, as well as the board, staff, organizations, and community stakeholders that support our students. So calculating AROI is not, as, not that easy, uh, because many of the programs and measures that we're using to move that needle uh, on student learning are intertwined, and sometimes those, the return takes place over time. Uh, but as Ms. Silvestri noted last night, we are uh, going to be presenting a tool that's going to assist in this important endeavor, our, the program budget. And creating this budget is a big lift, but we plan on having this done <clears throat> later on in the spring. Um, by organizing our budget by program, our stakeholders will be able to easily see the amounts budgeted and spent on some of our major program initiatives. And not just what was done in the current year, but we'll see what was done in, in prior years, as Dr. McKnight alluded to. Uh, this is not to say that we're not going to that we're going to discontinue organizing our budget by chapter, because this is also an important tool to see how we are managing our departments and our divisions. 
as well as we are going to continue to budget by state category because it's it's required and this is how we present our budget to the county. So what, what you're looking at now is, is one of the things when we do uh, budget by category, um, administration uh, sometimes comes uh, comes up in the conversation, how much are we spending on administration or central office compared to schools and learning? Um, and I'm proud to say that MCPS is always uh, in that lower tier. You can see here, this was based on actual uh, administrative expenditures from the FY21 uh, uh, consolidated annual financial reports. Um, so we, we can also look at this in a couple of different ways. We can look at what we, the number of staff we spend too. So in your budget and table, Five. If you look at the first two or three um, lists of positions, which are basically administrative positions, uh, that falls actually below two percent of our total total staffing. Um, next slide. Um, so we also we we build our budget, and we're going to be talking today about different uh, uh, building blocks of that budget. So. Going from the bottom up, as, as Dr. McKnight noted, we're going to talk about accelerators because we feel that warrants a separate discussion in our next um, in our next uh, work session. Going up from the bottom, salaries, benefits, and health care, that is our largest uh, part of the budget at $145 million. Um, inflation, reductions, rate changes, and realignments, that's what you're going to be hearing a lot about today in the different chapters. So realignments um, are cost neutral. Um, but sometimes they're not cost neutral within that chapter. Sometimes we're moving money from one chapter to the other. And you hear, you hear about some of that today. And the final building block is enrollment changes. And as we noted, uh, this is the first year where we're seeing an increase, um, uh, which is going to help us. And it's also going to come at a cost because um, we're going to be hiring more staff to accommodate that enrollment increase. Um, so with that said, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Ms. Rubin to talk about chapter two. Thank you. Good morning, uh, President Silvestri, Vice President Evans, and the board. Um, I'm happy to be here to discuss Chapter 2, School Support and Well-Being. I'm Rochelle Rubin, Chief of School Support and Well-Being. And so our mission in OSSWB is to create the continuous conditions for all of our students to thrive and experience excellence through the development and implementation of professional learning comprehensive and coordinative programs, and a focus on learning, accountability, and results. Our, we work intentionally, excuse me, in three ways to facilitate and actualize the anti-bias, anti-racist mission. That is by supporting and supervising schools as agents of the student's academic success and the elimination of predictable outcomes. These will be done by ensuring recruitment, retention, and professional development of our human resources. And by operationalizing a culture of wellness and safety for all our stakeholders with specific intention to how students of color are experiencing their well-being. And so the board has done a great deal to support this work. And I'm happy to have the opportunity to just walk through it. Next slide. So you will see um, here the majority of our work in this chapter is supporting salaries and wages at about $65 million there. Within this area, all of our supports are aligned to the board's strategic priorities, all four areas, including building safe and inclusive climate, improving math and literacy rates, improving retention and recruitment, and supporting two-way communication. Um, we do have contractual services that include our um, the professional learning, the RAP program, as well as uh, uh, social and emotional well-being needs. Next slide. The offices that comprise um, the student wellness and student support and well-being are um, the Department of Psychological Services, International Admissions and Enrollment, um, our Division of Student Leadership and Extracurricular Activities, Athletics, and certainly Community Schools, which we've added over the last few years, and then the Division of Early Childhood Title I and Recovery Programs. So you will see that we have some realignments, increases, and redistribution of funding across the office, including looking at how we successfully manage and provide resources for teaching and learning, including a 1.0 position supervisor um, in the Office of School Support and Well-Being. 
we did realign or move to 26 of our instructional spe specialist positions to the school so that they are directly supporting the work um, that's happening with staff development teachers, principals, and the leadership team. And then certainly our psychological, our psychology services looking at a 1.0 coordinator position to support the work of crisis management, which we're happy to be aligned with our partners in Dr. Kapunin's office. Um, we also have included some improvements for the Department of Athletics with 2.0 instructional specialists in order to support the wellness and well-being and the oversight of the operational and district-wide athletic program. And then finally, for our community schools, 2.5 central office teacher positions and a 6.0 parent community coordinator positions were realigned so that we're adding our um, eight wellness counselors. Uh, those positions are based based on program requirements and need-based assessments. Next slide. And then finally here, you will see that we have some grant changes and shifts, uh, as well as efficiencies and reductions uh, in the positions and the redistribution of around 225,000. An example of this, um, the result of programmatic changes within Title III, English language acquisition grant, the following positions were shifted to the local budget to support the continuity of the current program. You will also see in Chapter 2 a reduction of four staff positions and savings from local mileage, reimbursement, and instructional materials. I, I think that's the discussion portion. Next. At this time, we're happy to take any questions. Um, just a clarification question. Uh, realignments are just you have the money existing funding and you're just using it differently this year. Exactly. So cost neutral. Could you say a little more about those decisions? Um, I guess not on everything, but maybe something that you think the board would not like to know in terms of we're all about how are we improving? How are our programs getting better? How are we learning from our social emotional uh, endeavors? So maybe you could just pick one that could exemplify that continuous improvement process. Sure. Um, I think when we think about the well-being needs and how we're examining uh, the program's efficiency, effectiveness, and evaluating, uh, the wellness trainers became an area where we saw the need to uh, really build out more robust supports to schools uh, by adding these various positions. Uh, with the realignments, what we would do is, for example, for some of those positions that were sitting that were vacant would be one way if we were not able to fill those positions we would take a look at those vacant positions realign them to positions that are needed and necessary and certainly um, based on much of what we've heard from the board the need to evaluate so we have a robust evaluation that's currently going on for restorative justice the same for the community schools following the state lead around how we're going to evaluate the effectiveness of the resources there and throughout all of our wellness so the psychology just beginning to collect that data, taking a look at how they're operationalizing within the schools, and then using all of that helps us through this uh, budget process to determine where the need is, the return on investment, and the effectiveness of those services to students, which is the uh, outcome that we're always seeking. The example that you started off with, the wellness coaches, you said? Trainers. Wellness, wellness trainers. That is their sole job in a school? Or is it a, like a, a teacher that has additional responsibilities? And what do they do exactly? So this will be their sole job to support the schools in taking a look at what are those wellness needs that are arising for students. Um, the great thing about the wellness trainers is that they also will be helping with staff. So currently we have a few at the elementary level where they're looking at some of those staff needs, those student needs, really building our work around the anti-racist audit and some of the needs that we see presenting there. because. 
what we're hearing from students and staff is the emotional impact of having to deal with some of the issues and having them right on board. I also feel like the wellness trainers will be additive to our student well-being teams to really build those out in a robust way at those schools where they are stationed. And then certainly as we continue to uh, see a rise in tide of suicidal ideation uh, among both staff and students, that is another opportunity for us to really leverage their services as well. And how many positions are there in the system? Currently eight. We're just, this is brand new. And as we said, as we go through this new robust evaluation system that I think the board has really pushed us to, it's an opportunity for us to assess really how we grow out or where we may stop something and start it based on the effectiveness and the return on investment. Thank you. Ms. Harris? Uh, yeah, thank you. Just a couple of um, questions. Um, you mentioned two additional positions in athletics to support that work. Could you be a little more specific about what those positions are envisioned to be and where they'll be located? Sure. I, I think you'll remember last year um, there was a great deal of uh, conversation around the athletic trainers and us not being able to really fill some of those positions across some of our most high need schools. And that's exactly what will happen. They will be charged with not only the oversight of that, but will allow for us uh, with some of the other changes that we've made to make sure that we have trainers in all of our spaces and then the oversight of those trainers was the other thing that we heard from our community members, right? So during games, the availability, who do they go to, who's supporting that? And so that's how that's being utilized. So these two positions would mostly not exclusively oversee the um, athletic trainers assigned to every one of our high schools. Um, so are the, quali are the qualifications of those individuals that they be also um, professionally qualified to be athletic trainers? I, I do believe that Mr. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, excuse me, has been working extremely hard to make sure that is the case. I think we've spent a great deal of time ensuring that we don't have some of the issues that we've had in the past. So that is our intent, yes. Yeah, I applaud that. I think um, it's pr problematic when you have people without the qualifications required of the people they supervise. So um, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we have had some ongoing, we have some great successes in our athletic programs, and we've had some challenges continuing, nothing new. I mean, we've seen issues for many years. One of the resources available to us for free, of course, is through the Family Justice Center and the um, uh, Coaching Boys and Men and Athletes as Leaders. It's free training. Are we taking advantage of that? The story that we've gotten for many years through the Advocates and the Allies is that coaches and those working directly with our student athletes can take advantage of those programs if they wish to, but there's no MCPS um, encouragement necessarily or expectation. Is that changing as we continue to see issues with some of our athletic programs? So I know that Dr. Sullivan has has been on the leading and the cutting edge of really looking at all of the ways in which we can enhance and take our athletic program to the next level. If we're not doing that with um, fidelity, that's something we're certainly open to, and I'm happy to go back and make sure that I'm having that conversation with Dr. Sullivan and the team. Yeah, as we talk operating budget and supporting the needs of all of our students, this is something we can do that doesn't cost us a dime. Right. So those are good resources to take advantage of. And b building on Ms. Um, Sylvester's questions, that so it's not wellness counselors, it's wellness trainers. That's the title for those eight. Yes. What are the professional qualifications in that job description? So I think we were, um, we followed the model and, and I can certainly go back and I wanna make sure I'm giving you the, the correct answer. I think we did follow the model we began using with international admissions, which is making sure that we are working with OHRD to get people who are vested and versed in the work um, and, and being flexible about uh, 
you know, some of the more rigid educational requirement pieces um, because we want those individuals for whom wellness is something that they're very versed in. And so I, I believe that's how uh, Ms. Duranby and the team has utilized the, the qualifications for the job, but I'm happy to double check and come back with a definitive answer. Yeah, I'd be interested to know if we're requiring any kind of professional level licensure certifications. Um, and you you mentioned eight trainers. So will they? How will they? We got two hundred ten schools. How will they be deployed? So we're looking at um, the team has been uh, really working on collecting quantitative data because you know that's always been a bit of a squishy issue when we talk about wellness, well-being, and the services. So how are we doing that? Voice data, looking at the needs, taking a look at our new serious incident database, for example, we can take a look at that and see how many suicidal ideations have come through for a particular school. So we are using some quantitative aspects and then certainly as our principals reach out for need, um, certain things like staffing, uh, looking at uh, the demographics. There are a variety of things that we're looking at to determine that. And then certainly we're e an analyzing where our schools are heavily resourced. And, you know, we do have some schools, like a community school, for example, might be heavily resourced. So making sure that we're taking the time to determine where the need is using some qualitative measures, but also those, uh, excuse me, some quantitative measures, but also those qualitative pieces by getting out, going into the school, seeing what's happening, talking to the principals, talking in the community um, to make sure that we are resourced and staffed appropriately appropriately across the district, because we do have 211 now schools. Yeah, right. Thank you. Clarksburg number nine. Um, and I would just say, you know, one of the issues that we continue to see, which is of great concern, I know, to all of us, is um, we are not immune to the opioid crisis in the, in the country. And we continue to see student overdoses, intentional and unintentional, somewhat tragic outcomes. And I would strongly encourage these individuals to have addiction, substance use, professional credentials, because um, I think we need to be far more proactive in working with our, and we've heard student testimony very recently on this very issue, and they see it too, and they want to be part of the solution. But um, I think if we can ensure that we are providing individuals that really do have that that substantive professional background um, that will help. And I know Dr. Kapunin is, is really focusing intently on this issue and making sure the wellness trainers are people who can work with her on implementing that, that those strategies. Um, I, anyway, that's just my ask because I, see, I don't see that issue abating anytime soon. Thank you. Sevens? Absolutely. And so I concur with Ms. Harris. Um, my question was around community schools, but I will say that um, I'm glad to see what we're doing in the area of athletics as a parent of a student athlete. Um, you know, we go to games, and I know that um, we talked about how we had to contract out trainers and stuff, so I think we're moving in the right direction. Appreciate that. So my question is around community schools. Um, I didn't catch everything that you said, but just remind everyone um, how many community schools we have. I think we have about 26, is that correct? Yes, about okay. 26 community schools. Um, for the first time, we will have some, uh, at least two, I believe, community schools at the secondary level. Um, and we're building out. We don't have as many as some districts, but certainly uh, working to build a robust community school program in MCPS. So are we, are we moving in a direction of um, doubling that number? If, if we take a look at the, the state requirements and certainly where some of the numbers have changed for many of our schools, uh, we could potentially see our community school numbers increase, yes. So tell me again what you said. I, I, I didn't catch it. I, I didn't, wasn't quick enough to write it down. How many, um, you said we're hiring for community schools. How many? You said eight? So, no, that was uh, the wellness training, oh, okay, right. but also the 2.5 central office teacher positions and six parent community coordinator positions. So very robust for the needs, as, as you know, um, which are great at the community school level. I was going to say, is that enough? Because um, we're expanding what we're doing. 
in terms of like the food pantries. I just saw recently on Twitter where we had council member Gabe Abernas go to, was it Weller Road? Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's a lot going on at our community um, schools and we want to make certain that they are adequately staffed, right, and can provide the support that our schools need. So is that everything that we need? Do we, are they, are the 26, do they have the staffing? that they need, I'm putting you on the spot. I'll, no, I'll no, we, <laughs> I was just at a community school meeting yesterday. Um, I, I, I would like to take the opportunity to just talk about the tremendous work that um, the team has done around getting additional grants that are helping to also build out the, commun the community school work. And I think um, they've done a tremendous job of doing that. Um, the principal seemed really pleased about where they are and the amount of services they have currently. And um, they're getting ready to engage in the community school training this summer. Um, so I, I feel like this helps and, and puts us on the road to where we need to be, in addition to some of the um, grants that the team has been able to secure. Okay. When you say team, you at the central office level? The central yeah, office the level, grants, yes. Right. right. Yeah, it will be a heavy lift, what the blueprint is requiring us to do. But that, that does not mean that these are not all great things that we shouldn't be doing. Um, okay, thank you. Just to remind board members that um, if you miss some of the numbers that Ms. Rubens mentioned in her presentation, they are in the appendix, so you can flip back to see, oh, how many people are we talking about? That, that might be helpful to you. Ms. Wolf? I just want to say Ms. Harris basically asked all of the questions that I had, but I wanted to understand of those, when you, do, well, what I want to do is put in an ask for the wellness trainers, that you be very considerate about diversity in that, because if you're placing trainers around, we want people that look like the people in the community that they're serving. So, I mean, I, I know that could be very hard to do, but I think that's very important, especially since you're tying a lot of this work to the anti-racist audit and what you're hearing in the audit. Can you talk to me a little bit about the 26 specialist positions? I think I got that right. It's, it's a little early in the morning that are being moved to the schools. I mean, what what positions? Where? They Right, so it was just a shift um, to align. So they actually were on one part of the budget, and so they were moved, I believe, from the central part of the budget to being to the school part of the budget. They're specialists, though. Are they math specialists, reading specialists, what, wellness? But what, what are they? These were the learning achievements. Learning and achievement. That's, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, my last question is about community schools. Aren't we adding community schools under the blueprint? We are. How many? Um, I don't have the exact number. I can get that to you, but I do believe we'll almost double what we have That's now. That's what I thought. Okay, I just yep. wanted to be sure. Thank you. Ms. Rivetta Aubin? Yes, um, uh, thank you so much. So um, I want us to, um, if you could just give me a little bit of, under the international admissions enrollment for that office. Um, we know a lot of our growth for, for, for new students last year was came out of that department. So I, I see the realignment in, uh, in, the, in the index, but my question is, I'm looking at adding uh, one residency international admissions intake specialist. My question is, is that enough? Because um, I know we had to uh, borrow uh, folks from other places to help us with a lot of that intake. And um, as we all know, it's, it's not, it, it's a lot of time commitment and um, 2,000 plus students came from there that we, we know of. And that is not gonna be going away. So I just wanna make sure that we have the staff numbers appropriate to ensuring that we, you know, we have an answer to to the influx of um, of refugee children who are coming in and others. So my question is, is that a, is that enough? And then, um, 
if you want to answer that, and I can go to my to my wellness trainers as a second part. Sure, sure. I think that's um, a fantastic question, and we've really worked to build out um, the Welcome Center for International Enrollment and Admissions. So in addition to the 1.0 resi residency uh, uh, intake specialist, there is going to be a 1.0 team leader, a 1.0 coordinator, and then we have the uh, one director two position. Um, that coupled with the significant changes uh, that have been made around the process and some of the technological needs that were, they were barriers. We were able to bridge that and we certainly appreciate the partnership with our um, Office of Technology in doing that. So this year, what we've seen so far that we've been very, very pleased about is that we have not had that overage of um, families waiting for an extended period of time to be welcomed in. So we feel Feel like what we have here coupled with all of the changes that were made will work but we certainly will be evaluating it and watching it as we go and, and my last question on that would be I, I see that you have a point for student well-being and achievement counselor could you just elaborate a little bit I'm, I'm new on the board I just trying to understand point four seems very small to me compared to the influx of so many and um, Again, um, is, that, is that enough? Right, so the past couple of budgets, we, we worked really hard to add to the counseling positions, especially at the elementary level because elementary was really not meeting, and, and we've seen some growth there, elementary was really not meeting the ASCA model. Um, so the, it, is, it seems small, the point four would add probably to a, a point six somewhere to make a full 1.0. Um, we continue to examine and we continue to say that in addition to our school counselors who serve, right, they have the academic role that they play and then they have sort of the direct services for social emotional needs. We really have work to build out the additional supports around wellness, right, through the social workers, the addition of wellness trainers, our partnership with HHS for the wellness centers at the schools. So looking to make sure, and we do have some more work to do to make sure that our students, our staff, and our families understand the multitude of resources that are available outside of our school counselors. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so going to the, um, the wellness uh, trainers, which um, I'm all for wellness, but it's such a broad thing. Um, so I'm trying to, to understand how, one, how we pick the schools that these wellness trainers folks will be going to? What's the process in that? And I know you say you would collect data and so on, but are they right now foots on the ground? Like, do we have them right now or this is what we're hiring? We have them. Wait, okay. And I'm, I'm happy to bring back the schools and the, and the process to you. And then just a, just a really uh, description of what a day-to-day, -day, you know, looks like. Because I know that we have other partnerships that MCPS has with, you know, nonprofits like Casa and Identity. We have the Wellbeing Centers as well. So I guess I'm trying to understand the connectivity that exists with all these programs. You know, we have how well do they work with them? Are they do they have meetings with them? You know, where everybody comes in and and they're on the same page, um, and uh, the training the training that they get, uh, the crossover that it is between HHS and our nonprofits. Um, because I think right now, uh, um, Ms. Harris and, and Ms. Wolf, you know, Ms. Harris said, you know, right now we, with the opioid situation that we're seeing, which is um, egregious and is something that we're all very concerned for, whether you have kids or not, it should be a concern for all of us. But also the fact that the, it needs to be delivered that um, some of these positions, either if you're with the community schools, the folks who are in charge of the community schools, um, the wellness folks, um, the six parent community coordinators are you asking for, that they, they really need to look like the kids that they're serving. Like, I think that has to be, and I, I made my, my feelings known to other folks at this table, um, that it needs to be almost deliberate, that you know, it needs to be a huge priority um, because we want these programs to be successful, and and that communication and and that needs to be there. It just has to be an ingredient, as well-intentioned folks that we are, 
um, you know, the trust has to be there. And a lot of these positions are, are building trust with communities that are not used to having the trust with government officials or with school systems, right? It's questionable in their own home countries and they're hurting and they want the help. So I think that needs to, to be part of this, this process and I, I, hope, uh, I hope that I'm being um, clear on that. Um, and just also to understand a little bit, um, we have a lot of schools that have a lot of things, but we have schools who are on the borderline that they're just, you know, few kids away from being farms, but they're not farms, and yet they don't have those resources. So I want us to be a little bit more prevented than reactive and to kind of look at that data as well, where we can be a little bit more preventive. Um, and maybe, you know, um, say, well, you know, we have all these other resources. Maybe this wellness person can go to this school because they're actually almost there to start building that relationship. But thank you very much. Thank you. I've captured that. Can I just follow up on something um, Ms. Oven said? I think that, um, oh, just that quick, it went out of my mind. Oh, I wanted to get this, the schools that the 26 learning and achievement specialists are going to be deployed to. And I also want to say something else that I, I'm going to say it, so I hope it comes out the right way. Normally, we're looking at schools that are highly impacted, but when you start thinking about wellness trainers, I want you to be sure that you're looking at all of our schools, because many of our schools that are not as, that we normally think of will need the, will need the service too. So. Ms. Yang? Actually, I think Ms. Wolf say that so well. Um, first of all, I want to amplify uh, Ms. Uh, Harris' point of in the future going forward when we are looking for mental health um, uh, staff that if they can have substance abuse background, that will be a tremendous help to our system. And to Ms. Wolf's point, mental health needs and substance abuse um, impact people of all backgrounds and all zip codes. So I would really like us to really look at all our schools and really look at where the needs are. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I apologize. I think I cut you off when you were answering Ms. Wolf's question about where the, your question was, where are the learning and achievement specialists she said she going? Back to me, I think, right? Right. I'll, I can come back to how they support schools overall and bring back that picture. I'm happy to do that. Oh, I got it first. <laughs> also, you know, I, I, I would like one time, and I don't know if we can do this, you know, we've got so many wellness programs, as Ms. Oven says, can we come back one time and talk about how they're interrelated? I mean, I'm, I'm having a little trouble focusing on creating new programs when we have programs. And, well, if we have programs, are they working or not working? Is that why we new, need new programs? I, I'm starting to get a little bit confused here, too. So, so uh, I would appreciate some discussion on that. I know this is a budget work session, and we're focused on the budget. But our next board meeting, February 7th, we will have a wellness and restorative practices uh, presentation with strategies to address bullying behaviors and explanation of how to measure success in wellness. So we can't go deep into this today because we're focused on the funding. but. Obviously, this is one of our four priorities, and we've made uh, significant and valuable investments, and so we're very interested on how to measure success. Uh, we are, as, as Ms. Wolf says, like the cohesion, like how does this all fit together so that um, we're being strategic in our investments, um, and where are we seeing uh, promising practices and results? Mr. Kim? Thank you. A um, couple of questions. Uh, first, regarding the uh, allocation towards supporting uh, administering 504 plans. Um, between the coordinator position, the instructional specialist position, and the stipends, uh, could you provide a little clarity about, you know, really how much of the investment is going towards professional development versus directly kind of alleviating the caseload of, of current school counselors? Um, Sure. Um, so this is our first attempt, and certainly we're going to be working alongside our partners in special education to really build out what would be a robust 504 support uh, 
sort of system in MCPS. So the, uh, the positions that are hired would be directly supporting schools. We have the data that illustrates the schools that have an over preponderance of 504s. So we're actually looking at that data, going through that to determine what supports and services those schools will get. In addition, we want to be able to continue to support some of the administrative tasks that come up for 504s so that the counselor isn't doing that and then having to administer the 504 and then still engage in their daily duties. And then here at Central Services, really looking for the compliance piece, right? That's the training that you spoke to. Really looking to work alongside our special education department in reference to those schools that may be behind with the compliance, what that professional learning entails, and how do we get that across the system scaled. That's really helpful, thank you. Um, and, and I also wanted to ask about um, some of those, those well-being pieces. Um, my understanding is at the start of this school year, um, all of our high schools had, had social workers, but that's not yet the case for middle schools and elementary schools. Uh, so I wanted to ask about the, I guess, the current practices and if, um, you know, the, the expectation uh, and perhaps, you know, if it's reflected in this budget, um, it, it is to increase the amount uh, in those schools um, and, and if that's been reflected in this budget or not. Right, so um, at the elementary level, we do have social workers that sort of have clusters of elementary right. schools that they support, but they do not um, have the one-to-one -one social worker support. So there's obviously, I think there's an interest in taking a look at evaluating. I, we're hearing the cohesion and the connectivity. So how do the MCPS social workers connect with the Bridge to Wellness social work? Like how is that all connected? And that's work that we're actively doing. And you'll hear some of that on February 7th, and so looking to see um, how we can continue to support our elementary schools, build out that work, and then evaluate the return on investment for, is that something that we need to extend? Um, certainly, I think, will be well worth uh, the discussion. Okay, thank you. Ms. Harris? Um, yeah, just a couple quick follow-up questions. I'm sorry, I forgot earlier. So looking here on one of the strategic accelerators, we're looking at uh, expanding college tracks to five additional schools. And we heard some testimony about college tracks last night. Um, do we, have you identified the schools yet that will, that will um, be served by that program next year? I don't believe we have, but I would certainly be happy to bring that back. And we're gonna delve into that at the next budget. Okay. Work session because yep. that's an accelerator. Yep. Um, thank you. Sorry. And then um, one last question. Can you direct me? Um, I think one of the things that we an issue that we continue to see in our schools that's of concern are are conflicts that are in the community that are then brought into the schools, and and we see those conflicts erupting in our buildings and on our school sites, and you know the community piece here. The intervention piece is sort of in our in our DHHS partners in the positive youth development space and the and the street outreach school outreach network space, but but that's the prevention piece. If we don't want these incidents coming into our athletic programs and our halls and walls of our schools and students from one school, like the incident we had at RM last Friday, you know the prevention piece has to happen in the community. And so how are we working, which are the people in our budget, in our wellness work that are focused on really tightly collaborating with our external partners who are experts in being in the, the boots, the ears, the eyes on the ground to identify, help diffuse, help heal, help restore in the community so we aren't seeing that conflict come into our schools? That's immediately your restorative justice group, and you'll hear from them. But I do want to say that that, um, that community piece and that um, prevention piece, it goes highly with trauma. And I think what you will see is there's a great deal of partnership going on, not just through the student services side of the house, but also with Dr. Kapunin and her staff. Because if you even take Kennedy's situation this weekend, 
where we were dealing with that, right? It's, it's all of us at the table with our partners in the community, right? Sometimes that may include law enforcement. Sometimes it's our HHS, it's our youth development, but it's a, it has to be a tightly knit and coordinated effort because what we see is that there is underlying trauma that's at the heart of whatever the behavior is. And so addressing not only the behavior and the restorative pieces that need to occur there, but the trauma that's uncovered as we're going through that process. So that collaboration, I think you'll hear a bit more on February the 7th between restorative justice, the community, and certainly our partnership with Dr. Kapunin's office. Thank you, because I really do think the extent to which we respond to it, we're responding instead of preventing. And then there's also, and it, you know, a lot often, I think too often in my opinion, that response is involving law enforcement. And whenever we bring law enforcement in, that enhances the fear and the drama. And, you know, when we have a, com a traumatized community, um, fear and drama are, are not, are our enemies. So we, we want to definitely bring that temperature down. So thank you. I look forward to that. Uh, Ms. Rippen, yes. Uh, sorry. Turn your mic. Just, um, it's not on. No. Darn it. Um, just a follow up. Um, when you bring up back that information, if you could just give us a breakdown of, with the community schools, with the para community <coughs> coordinators, the wellness folks, just a breakdown of demographics, who they are, uh, in a sense, um, staff. staff. Yeah, for this, for the, for the staff. And I don't know if at that briefing, if we're going to have a briefing on community schools since separate. It's, it's separate, but I would really like us to, to, to do that <laughs> in, uh, in, in, the, in the near future. And then related to budget, one of the missions is family and community engagement uh, for the well-being um, office. I just, I'm trying to, to have a better grasp um, the funding for that to happen in this budget. Like, the, you know, um, and also just to understand quantitative, you know, so, um, so you know, six parent uh, community folks will be serving this amount of students. Uh, this is, you know, this is the impact they're gonna have. I'm just trying to, to get a better grasp on the impact that these positions are gonna have on, on the children and the families. And again, with the family and community engagement, I'm just trying to, to understand where some of those supports are gonna be uh, and just kind of have a clear, better idea because we heard in our testimony that two-way communication it is so, so vital um, at every level. So, thank you. Okay. Um, if I could just comment, thank you. Um, such a, a refreshing thought to this approach of how we, are, how we address just community engagement. Um, I wanted to call, it's so interesting because you just gave a perfect example of how the budget bills. So last year, we invested in a medical officer, new position to help with the exact conversation that we're talking about, not just informing um, and, and impacting internally what we do around wellness, but the community as well. As you know, Dr. Kapunin is out, she's here, there, everywhere. Um, you know, in terms of an example of that. We also invested in another position, our senior community advisor. Um, uh, Elba is also in that position helping, and, and actually one of the things we're going to talk about is her working so closely with the communications office, which you know we've branched out this year, because we recognize that community engagement, uh, communication, <laughs> go hand in hand around this whole work of what we're saying is really well students in a well community. Um, so some of the investments that you're asking about, um, Ms. River Oven, was some, that were some that we started last year and that we're continuing to build on. Um, so I just wanted to, to point that out because some of what we're seeing are some of the expansion within the offices, um, but some of it was to do better coordination within our offices that exist. And that's why I call out the two key positions that we put in place, the senior community advisor and the medical officer last year, because we recognized that these were some things that need to come full circle and have a much more organized, intentional approach, because we have an office of community partnerships. We have an office of well-being. Um, we have a communications office. And in all of these offices, we have these different groups that we work with. So we're just trying to better align that 
So I, I hear your question. It's like, you know, well, how does this work with this? But uh, the alignment is a big part of it. If, if, do you understand what I'm saying in terms of that? And the other part of uh, uh, another conversation I wanted to say we wanted to, um, that in which we could expand this even more of how we've tried to create these systems of alignment would be in the committee meeting, communication. Stakeholder engagement. Thank you, stakeholder engagement. Thank you. I could not get the communications and stakeholder engagement um, because we've tried to move much of the conversation of how we're organizing and being very proactive in the communications piece that is very much connected to community engagement. So I think that's another place in which we can also come back and really talk about how we connect some of the dots. And most importantly, what's happening in the community as a result of these investments. Are we getting more involvement from communities that we don't normally have much involvement from? What does that involvement tell us about implications for our work and how we do work moving forward? So I just wanted to point that out, too, because I think that's another space in which we can dive in. But it's so important. And if nothing else in this conversation, I think it comes back to we as a school system, even with the investments that we have, we have to depend on the partnerships <laughs> to do this work. And we should. And I think that's a good example, Mr. Riley, correct me if I'm wrong, of a program budget topic mm -hmm. that what yeah. you're developing will help us. Uh, Thanks for bringing that up. I was going to bring that up because this is areas where it does cross different chapters, right? But as right. Dr. McKnight mentioned, last year we had investment in medical officer and community liaison. That would be something if we had a, a program for family engagement, you would see that investment from prior year and any new investments to come. Um, right now, we're in the process of determining those programs. Just to give you a little background, the last time we did a program budget was FY17. We had about 85 programs, uh, so we're try it's kind of a balance, right? Um, we can we can do m we're probably going to do more because we have more programs and we have a lot more emphasis on well-being and family engagement. So I foresee those coming in as programs, but. Um, we're going to have to determine what, where we get the bang for the buck and how we're going to use that information along with evaluations and determine, you know, what's in that budget to yeah. use it as a tool. We don't need to do everything but more strategic things yeah. yes, yeah. that are important to the system. Ms. Yang. Yeah, so I have a comment. So um, we all know that a mental health issue is not 8 to 5 on Monday to Friday issue. And I know that we are talking about our school system's budget, but it's always to tackle mental health. It's always a whole society's effort. And I know that MCPS have partnership with JASA, have partnership with every mind. So I think that's an important message that all shepherds spread, that we need to get out to the community, including when people come to testify, because there are other overlaying services that's happening. So in our conversation in February, when we delve into really deep dive, maybe we can see some of those offerings because we are not, we do not exist in isolation. Mm -hmm. And mental health is, we are all working as a whole county towards helping our students. So I think that way we can have a more comprehensive look for our community, for our board member, and for our staff. Thank you. Um, yes, and I welcome that opportunity. In the past, what we've done, which has been successful, and I, we will plan to do the same thing for this upcoming board meeting, is we've actually brought some of those partners in to the table so that you can hear from our perspective in MCPS how we work and establish these partnerships, but also hear from them. Um, I, 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 I think it's really important, and quite frankly, um, if we were to think about the partners that we use for every single topic that we discuss, we would probably have someone else at the table that we partner with um, around all of the initiatives in MCPS. So um, we will plan for that, and thank you. I look forward to it. Final question for this section, because we do have to move on. But uh, going back to the international admissions and enrollment, and I think this is just feedback for each of the sections, is... Um, why, why these changes? Just high level explanation. Um, you know, this is better this year because, just to help me understand, because otherwise it's like add this, take away this. That's meaningless to me. What are, what's the problem we're trying to fix? Why is this better than the current state? 
No, sure, absolutely. Specific to international admissions and enrollment, I think for several years we we had a situation where we had a backlog of our students and families waiting to be enrolled, and it certainly did not send the message um, that we want to convey in our system that every single student and their families are welcomed in MCPS. So these changes make a difference in how we welcome our families, how we get them acclimated, how we get them enrolled into school quickly and moving along academically, which is always our outcome. Everything that happens in this office, the outcome is to support the academic growth and success of our students. And these uh, these investments allow us to do that. And you can see that we have uh, shortened that time span. We've received just great feedback from families about their experience there. And more of our families are still coming because they're getting a better experience, which enriches our program. Yes. OK, thank you. I think we can move on. Good afternoon, President Silvestri, Dr. McKnight, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to share about Chapter 3 Academics. Um, newly formed last year, the Chief Academic Office was created uh, in order to lead both the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs, you often hear it termed OSIP, and the Office of Special Education, really elevating um, curriculum and instruction and making sure teaching and learning is a, is a priority here in Montgomery County Public Schools. So those two offices actually work together to make sure that all students have access to high quality first instruction that takes into account who they are um, when we're planning that instruction and so that it is um, culturally reflective of our students and their families and is also anti-racist, which is new work this year based upon the data. So the shared mission, uh, I think, is the board's core mission, is, is that all students be prepared for success in college, uh, career, and community. Uh, this office collaboratively monitors the student learning in a cross-functional team approach, working with other offices to look at data and also to determine what is best to make adjustments for curriculum and instruction and those resources that go along with teaching and learning. So in order to do this at a very high level, the office designs and revises a robust curriculum pathwork, uh, coursework for all students. It designs career preparation programs that lead to industry standard credentials. It also increases access to and support for students in advanced programs and coursework, including college credit, and provides a continuum of services for students with disabilities from birth to 21 so that each student can be successful, whatever their chat chosen path may be. To do the work effectively, there were some guiding principles that included wellness, teaching, and learning. We know that a core of planning instruction is that we know and plan for our learners. It means knowing who they are, who their families are, where they come from, what their interests are, what their uh, what their uh, talents are in order to build on those to plan learning. We also know that we need to plan for acceleration, which includes making sure that all students have access to grade level standards and that they have the support to do so through positive teacher-student relationships, through um, scaffolding as appropriate, and also through feedback uh, to the students about how they're doing progressing towards those standards. We added that it's critical that we implement the curriculum. We have a variety of curriculum in a variety of phases of life. Um, and so in order to really fairly assess a curriculum, it's important that we use it in order to determine which curricula are having the impacts that we believe that they should on students. In order to do that, we also must engage in continuous data analysis using the current formative assessment, but also taking a look back. How did our evidence of learning inform our practices? And how will we use the new state data that will be coming um, in order to refine our approaches or to revise our approaches? Um, and so that's the final piece is that we make sure that, that both offices will continue to learn and innovate, making sure that we're using the best practices for our students. Next slide, please. 
So this new office was designed to support the board's priorities that you see across the bottom there, including the safe and inclusive school environment, clearly improving math and literacy rates, and then improving retention and recruitment by allowing us to have a coordinated approach, including feedback to staff as they are working to implement the plans and processes. So the chapter three budget is actually a, a new piece, it's really just my office. It's me and three other people. <laughs> so, um, but the, that office also includes the salaries and wages for those four, and then the uh, supplies and materials and the um, other category. The supplies and materials in this budget uh, last year were much bigger because it was a new office and we needed to create a new space and provide all of the technology needed to get up and running. So there was a reduction this year, which is actually appropriate because now we just need to maintain things like paper, making sure that we have professional materials and office supplies uh, that would support the, office, uh, the work of both offices in the curriculum and instruction and in special education. Next slide, please. So this year, in order to increase operational efficiency, the proposed uh, budget includes a reduction of one copy editor. We think that's appropriate because we can streamline the production of consistent and high quality work by passing through one copy editor at the end of uh, the work that's been created, thankfully to the office of the deputy superintendent who has allowed us to use that service, which really does create more uh, streamlined approaches. Next slide, please. Okay, so good morning, President Silvestre, Dr. McKnight, and members of the board. I'm going to talk about uh, the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs in Chapter 4 and um, just share the primary outcomes, some of which you've already heard, but uh, our office is really here to improve student outcomes um, by providing high quality, rigorous instruction, culturally relevant and responsive instructional materials, providing access and opportunities for all of our students to engage in rigorous courses and academic programs, and we want to ensure that we're providing materials our professional development, and our programs that promote equitable teaching and learning. So there are three departments in the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Program, and I'm just going to very briefly touch on them before we get into the budget. So first we have the Department of Pre-K-12 Curriculum and District-wide Programs, and they provide a variety, uh, work with a variety of internal and external stakeholders, including our students, to develop purchase and evaluate our curricular resources. And our goal is for all of our students to see themselves in the curriculum, and we want them to see themselves through gender, race, ethnicity, and orientation. And we also work with um, our advisory group that we meet with, the, again, central office school base and our external st stakeholders. And they provide us uh, feedback on our current and future resources. This um, department also does a lot of work with professional development for our, our schools and also district-wide. So um, they are quite busy um, making sure that we are supporting our students and our staff. The other department, uh, Department of College and Career Readiness and District-wide Programs, helps to develop and expand special programs at elementary, middle, and high school. All of our work is to increase um, equitable access to special programs for our students, while also being mindful of our local programs. So we want to ensure that our local pro programs are strong so that families don't feel like they have to leave their local school in order to go to a program, but that they have a variety of options and that they're all very strong options. Um, the Accelerated and Enriched Instruction Unit is also in this department as well. So the work that you've been hearing around our enriched literacy curriculum and some of the other things happen in that department. And finally, we have the Department of English Learners in Multilingual Education, and they provide culturally responsive instructional materials and professional learning for our staff. And we want to make sure that we are really supporting our students who come from a variety of linguistic backgrounds. We want to reinforce to all of our staff and to our community that when students come to us um, with a variety of languages that it's seen as an asset and we are, are approaching it that way. And we want to ensure that all of our staff 
own the learning of our multilingual learners and that it's not just um, put onto one person in a school. And so that's really a lot of the work that we've been doing this over the last couple of years. So if you can go to the next slide as we get into the budget for OSIP, 77% of OSIP's budget is towards salaries and wages. The majority of that is from the local budget, but we have a large number of grants in um, OSIP, and so we do have some positions that are grant funded. Um, you can see also we have contractual services, 9% um, at $2.4 million. The contractual, contractual services include things like our outdoor environmental education. Um, we have a number of assessments that we contract and, and that is paid for through that, that budget. Um, out of school time, we have um, grants through Title III, our emergent multilingual learners, um, Perkins grant, and, and things of that nature that we fund through those contracts. And then you can see there we have um, supplies and materials and, and other fees. Next slide, please. So as we talk about um, realignments, um, we want to ensure, as we've been talking a lot about um, our summer school programming and tutoring programming, currently those positions are grant funded and we want to ensure as we move into the future that we have a permanent position in our local budget. So we have done some realignment of an instructional specialist position and also some contractual services money to ensure that we can have a permanent position as we move through the future. We also um, want to realign funds. We have a current um, part-time instructional specialist for PE and health in our office, and it's very difficult to support schools and retain that position with a part-time position. So we've done some realignment to ensure that we have a full-time person that can support our schools with that work. And then we also have um, some student enrollment increases in our interim instructional services. Um, some people know it as home and hospital um, services. So um, we want to ensure that we have a, an instructional specialist who can further support that work. And again, um, realigning funds to ensure that that happens. And then, as I shared with you um, the last time, with our CREA position for those students that are coming to us um, a little older, we are taking funds from one chapter and moving them to chapter four so that we can have a specialist support the work of CREA. And we have, um, I think when we started CREA, we had about 20 students, and now we're at about 120 students. And so we want to make sure that we are supporting the work there. Next slide, please. Maybe go back one slide. Did I miss it? Okay. I apologize. You did it. You said that. I said it. <laughs> okay. Um, go go one more slide, please. That's what you just said about where the distribution was. Okay. I just want to make sure I've got it all. So. The, the next thing we want to share with you, um, if I put my glasses on, that might help me. Um, if the next um, I want to share with you is that we have some grant changes. Um, when we have positions in grants, um, we want to make sure that over time, we move them to the local budget if we still feel that that position is really critical. So we have two positions in the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education that um, we feel very strongly need to be shifted um, to our local budget. And one is a position um, that supports our data and our ESOL staffing. It's a specialist position, and we also have another position that supports two-way immersion that we um, hired last year that we want to move into um, our local fund. So it's just sh making a shift. We also have outdoor education. Um, we have some increases. We are expecting um, about 121 additional sixth graders in outdoor education, and so we want to make sure that we um, budget for those the additional students, and so we have an, a student increase there. And additionally, outdoor education, um, the 
uh, sites have also increased their um, funds. So at, this, at one point it was, I believe, uh, $97 per student, and now they're at 100 a little over $100 per student. So um, those changes will require us to add additional funds to outdoor education. And then we have some um, reductions um, that we want to, to just uh, any efficiencies around contractual services, uh, instructional materials, and professional part-time salaries. Um, so, so those are reductions and efficiencies that we have there. And I believe that is it for, okay, next slide, all right. I'll stop for any questions. Ms. Yang? Yes, thank you so much for the presentation. And um, you stated, and as a system, we um, want to meet our students where they are. Besides our choice programs, we really have been, in the past few years, try to shift to a stronger local school programs to meet the acceleration and enrichment needs of our students. Uh, last night, we heard testimony from MCC PTA uh, in regards of um, staff allocation to the team in AEI um, and five staff numbers. Uh, members uh, to oversee this 211 school system, including choice programs and local school enrichment. Do you find that sufficient uh, staffing for these purposes? Um, that's a great question. I, I think that um, as we move forward and continue to build out our enrichment programs and we continue um, with some of our new initiatives with middle school, middle years program and things of that nature, we may need to look at um, adding an accelerator in the future for additional staffing to support that work. Um, we have committed to um, putting the enriched literacy curriculum into all of our schools, um, and we are already supporting um, accelerated mathematics at the elementary level, and so with that, requires staff to support the work in, in schools, and so that may be something that we'll have to look at in the future f to support. So not this year, meaning in the future years to look at, because I know that you still have, ELC has not rolled out completely yet, so, Correct. okay. We're gonna add about, we're gonna add 60 more schools next school year. Exactly, so, you know, that is one area. So I know that it's always a limited pool of money, but there are a lot of needs. So I'm glad this is on your radar so that we can build it out. Um, my next question is, I'm not sure where this fall under our counselors. Um, do they fall under this department's budget or a different department's budget? Ms. Rubens. Uh, Ms. Rubens. So may I go back and ask a question uh, on that chapter about the budget item? Sure, go ahead. Yes. Counselors. Correct me if, um, let's see, I understand this correctly. We have 44 part-time elementary school counselors. Um, um, and they were funded by, or they are currently funded when they when they were established by federal money. Is that money continuing going forward? Yes, yeah, so my understanding is they'll mm. continue to be funded. They will continue to be, so, so we still save so that it doesn't need to be in our budget to cover. <coughs> right now, the, yes. Right now, okay, okay. But we have elementary counselors in our base budget. This is supplemental to that. Yes, we do have counselors in our base budget as well. Okay. Is that what you mean, Ms. Yang? I think the, the 44 part-time elementary counselor position when they were created, we were using a federal grant to, pro, to create those positions. So I am just want to make sure we don't have a funding cliff than, than this 44 that, positions. That grant continues. That grant that continues. continues. Yes. Okay, okay, in the coming year. Thank you for that clarification. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ms. Wolf and then Ms. Rivera. I don't have my notes with me from one of the hearings, but we keep getting questions on instructional materials. And I notice that each one of these chapters has instructional 
materials. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? And is there an ability to access the materials? Is, is there an, like an online where there's, the kids could go and access the book or whatever it is they need? Could, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it does depend on the content area or course <coughs> or level. Um, when we purchased a new curriculum for elementary and middle school in literacy and mathematics, it came with a, a multitude of online resources. So um, parents can access those resources. Um, I, I have heard some comments that they don't have, um, that they don't think they have resources, so that may be something that we need to do in terms of improving our communication to let parents know what the access is for the math and literacy resources, but they do have them um, to, to see them and to be able to follow along with what their students are doing. Um, students certainly have that access as well. We. Um, have not been purchasing as many hard copy materials um, as we have in years past. Um, depending on the content area, some companies don't provide, you know, we've just kind of moved into more of a digital um, age for a lot of these things. Um, and then schools do have their own instructional materials, many to purchase additional resources, and we give schools lists of materials if they, oftentimes they will say, what would you recommend we purchase with our money? And we also give schools um, lists for purchasing as well. Okay, Does well, that answer your question? Well, I'm not sure because actually I don't have the notes in front of me, but the, general, the, young, the young man who is on the budget committee raised the issue about instructional materials. And so I was trying to understand, is it is this the money that you get instructional materials from and you're reducing it? So what are you taking out? For under, under curriculum, you're taking out. So what are you taking out? So schools get their own. So the question that was asked at the, uh, mentioned by the student, Nico, yeah, was about APIB, um, or AP really. Um, and schools that's do it. get um, funding for those materials. And um, it's up to the schools to um, purchase those materials and make sure that they have the newest versions. Um, so we are following up with schools to make sure they're clear about what the latest versions of those materials are, what they need to be spending with their, their school-based budget. Um, but this money is, this is not, um, is okay. just for OSIP, not okay. for the schools. Okay, but you are following up with the schools yes. to be sure that they have the latest materials available for their students. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Yeah, and AP is is one that you, you need to submit your curriculum, which includes what your what materials you're going to use from a list that is approved from College Board. So each person who is um, trained and qualified to teach an AP course develops his or her curricula as part of their training and then at the end of the training the materials they've selected generally align with what we've recommended and College Board generally does a 10-year renewal process unless something significant changes in in content. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bedard. Thank you. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm still learning the ropes a little bit, so I don't know if this is where this would be, but we heard a lot about testimony about the tutoring. Um, so is that in this? Is it, okay, good. Okay, so I'm, I'm so far so good. Um, I guess uh, you were talking about uh, the two-way immersion program. I have a couple of questions. One, um, why... Um, what the redistribution of those two positions from the English learners and multilingual education? Uh, why? What was the thought behind it? And because every time I see we lose anything with data, I get nervous because if we need anything more than anything, it's data. So hold that thought. But with the tutoring, um, where does that fall in in this area of um, bilingual tutoring? Meaning. Um, you have a child who comes with a very solid base of math, right? And uh, they are ESOL students. Um, where do we, at what point do we use that tutoring tool that we have to support the enrichment of that child, whether it be in Mandarin or in Spanish or French, to continue to build on what that child already knows? Because one of my biggest issues is 
the loss of just because you're easel doesn't mean you're not capable of doing the work. It just doesn't mean you don't understand it. And, and, and you know, and we have misconceptions. You know, children, we're like, oh, children learn so fast in the little sponges. Well, n no, there's a lot going on. There's the whole social impact. There's the whole emotional transition that takes place. There's the whole trauma that takes place. So I'm just trying to see where do we meet those needs of those kids when it comes to inst instruction, right? Um, and do we actually have um, instruction uh, through tutoring in different languages? And then if you could just answer the, the shift and why that shift took place. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll answer the question about the shift first. Um, so just to clarify, we think those positions were so important, we wanted to keep them and make them permanent positions, taking them off of the grant and putting them into local. So, yes, we agree with you. I, I'm so sorry. You know, you <laughs> yes. have to, like, you know, yes. be patient with me. No, 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 it's fine. I'll get better. Um, so, yes, we absolutely agree with you. We did not want to lose those positions. Um, we wanted to keep them in, in local. Um, and then in terms of our tutoring, most of that, those funds come from our ESSER um, our grant funds. And so you may not necessarily see the numbers reflected in the OSIP budget, um, but they are uh, part of our ESSER funds. Um, and we do have, um, obviously, if um, schools, we, we do provide a, a list of criteria for, I heard the question yesterday about tutoring. Um, we do provide schools multiple measures um, for consideration, whether it be grades, whether it be district data, whether it be classroom um, measures or external testing data, these are the types of multiple measures that we recommend you review in considering who a student will be. If a student who um, receives ESOL services is identified as needing um, tutoring, then they can receive I either the um, tutoring that is provided through um, additional support with content. They can receive a tutoring through a variety of our interventions that we have identified um, for our students. And we have a few interventions to our multilingual learners. Um, and so they are research-based, evidence-based interventions that we have identified for those students. They may not necessarily provide intervention in the second, in the other language, the, the students' um, home language, but they, they definitely um, will provide additional support in English um, for our students. So we don't necessarily have interventions. We have a few that support students who are bilingual with Spanish, but not in other languages outside of that. Um, so, you know, if you want to add to that. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Oh, thank you. Yes, I think one of the things that you bring up is the fact that our students have the content knowledge, but they have it in their native language. And so because of that, it's teaching them the academic language in English that is equal to. And that is the co-teaching model that occurs in first instruction, right? We want to know that and be able to address that as soon as we're planning for core instruction for a student in the class who, who we know even when learning to read, um, they can read in Spanish and they're learning to read in English, but it doesn't help to just word call and decode if they don't understand what the word means. So that is the purpose of uh, the co-teaching model to make sure that there is um, intentional planning towards making sure the students have the academic language in both languages. And, and lastly, I just, um, out of curiosity, my, my thought is with the with, uh, with students um, who are ESOL, I, I'd be very interested to know what's the ratio, right? What's the ratio teacher to student? Um, uh, is it, is, does it look the same as for general folks, you know, who are, uh, and if not, why not? Um, because of, you know, if we are very deliberate about equity and inclusion, I think we need to look at all the barriers that are keeping us from getting there. And, um, and like Dr. McKnight said, you know, we're, we need to look at these budgets as we are building on, you know, a little bit at a time, but we need to keep on building. So we ask for something one year and then we don't ask it for the next year. It's really relevant to progress, right? So, and we know that, um, 
the majority of our children are, you know, are, are, are you know, I, I hate that term, majority, minority, but um, that's where we are, and I just want to make sure that we take all those factors into account. So if you could get that um, that information, I think that would be uh, that would be uh, wonderful. Yes, we will we will provide that information to you. We do staff um, based on ESOL level, and so our earliest levels one get more staffing than students who are near exiting. So we certainly will give you share those ratios with you. And just a commercial on March seventh, we will have our deep dive into the. ESOL program. Let's go to Ms. Harris. We haven't heard from okay. her yet. Oh, thank you. Um, so we just wanted a little bit of a follow-up. So Ms. Wolf's question about instructional materials, um, we're seeing a lot of advocacy right now around ensuring that we are providing robustly non-digital learning materials for our students. <gasps> and the advocates are not wrong that the overuse of digital materials is, is not healthy for the developing brain in, in lots of ways. You know, it, getting those tactile materials, books, you know, that you hold in your hand, pencil, paper, pen, paper, academic work is, is laying down the, you know, the circuitry in the brain that, that helps with attention building. We're seeing an epidemic of short attention span theater with students who are overly reliable on digital and social media. And you know they're not attending for more than a year. They won't read a whole book. It takes too long. And that's, that's a trend that definitely needs to be reversed. And it even gets to fine motor coordination. If you're not learning how to write, you are missing out on, on, on significant fine motor development at a critical developmental stage. And so I just want to make sure that we are not just kind of throwing up our hands and saying, well, the wave of the future is everything is online, because that's not what's most, that's not what's best for our, our, our young developing brains. Um, and so I appreciate that we are seeing um, an emphasis on ensuring uh, current materials and adequate um, access to these materials. Um, and then I also wanted to follow up on Ms. Uh, Rivera Oven's um, questions around our EML work. Um, and I appreciate, once again, and I think we talked about it at the first, um, our first work session around the co-teaching model, because we've known for years that the way we are serving our, our you know, whatever acronym we've used to describe our, our, our newcomer students who are um, in, you know, emerging in their English language capacity but are fully fluent in another or more than in one other language, and it hasn't been serving them well. So we see students who have done very, very well in their classrooms, and every time we assess them, they do less well than their native English-speaking peers. That's not, that's not the students, it's the, it's the assessments. And our teachers, and we've heard good comment last year from some of our ESOL teachers, they know what works to teach their students, but central office pedagogy is telling them they have to do something else. Stop telling start asking. So we're seeing more of that, which I appreciate. But one of my concerns is when we talked about the co-teaching model earlier, it is robustly supporting all the things that you all were both talking about when we have students who are learning and mastering that academic language um, so that they can actually show what they know. They can actually build on their ac acquired knowledge. But we can't support it in all of the schools where we need it. And so you know, this is more an observation, I guess, but having, you know, done a pretty deep dive on the evidence base on how we serve newcomers well, you know, having read the UNICEF report from 2022 and, you know, gone to multiple, you know, workshops and convenings with high-flying school systems in this area like Oakland Unified, I still believe that we are not serving these our newcomer students as well as we can because we are too, um, too scattered. And... You know, when we can't support the co-teaching model in all schools, we need to, I think, we need to look at concentrating those resources and concentrating where we are, are putting our newcomer students, at least for the first year or two, so that we can completely serve them with a robust um, wraparound services model and that co-teaching and those um, academic, you know, best practices that we know work. Um, 
and you know, I don't. I, I've heard over the years we've had these conversations that we don't want to segregate these students. It's not segregating them; it's supporting them, making sure that we have the resources we need to to provide them the best instruction we can, the most effective instruction we can. And so, I, it's just my observation that you know, I wish we could talk about concentrating those services into perhaps fewer locations so that we can really robustly support the learning and ensure these students are really on a solid you know, foundational, educational, and academic pathway, because it does as you get older and as you, you are told you are not doing well, when you are working really hard and you have abundant skills, because let's be clear, adversity and resilience serve swim in the same stream. These students have amazing skills and capacity, but when they're being told that you're doing less well, because we are, we are not adopting a model that's going to as, as robustly support their learning as we can, then I think that's why this, this is our population of students that, that, that um, drops out more frequently. And, and so, I, again, that's just an observation, but I really wish we could have that conversation robustly. Um, and, and we will have that conversation. Um, we're going to start it next week when we hear with our special populations, the Center for Applied Linguistics has done, has um, will share their recommendations around the very thing that you're talking about, and then we'll come back in March to talk about what our plan is going to be to support that work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that very much. And then I also appreciated the, the mention of you know we want to make sure that every that our local programs are strong, so there isn't this kind of shopping around for good opportunities for schools. But you know we can't have that conversation without acknowledging some of these really amazing opportunities are highly highly limited. I mean there's a reason that Poolsville is always ranked as one of the best high schools in Maryland. And if you want global ecology, you have to go there. <laughs> we haven't made that that program really robustly accessible. And we do have the CASE program now, which is we need to support those programs and grow them and sustain them. But they're, again, that's only at two schools. So, you know, it, yes, we want to make, we want to make our, our local schools very, very strong. But I think we do need to also look at making sure that some of these, some of these, um, Specialized programs that we we can't we can't establish in every school for many many reasons, but we want to make sure that they are geographically accessible. Ms. Harris, and yeah, just my other commercial break. Um, yeah. <laughs> academic program yep. is coming to the full board on April twentieth, okay. including their program evaluation. So we'll go awesome. yeah. deep at that time. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, thank you. Um, but expanding that with fidelity and quality, yeah. Okay, Ms. Sylvester, may I add a comment? So in this, our operating budget, at the risk of sounding uh, like a broken record, mm -hmm. in this operating budget, we do have, uh, we, we have allocated $5 million for tutoring. Three million for high dosage and two million for online. That is apart from the ESSER fund. So I don't know whether it's in the upcoming workshop days or in upcoming board meetings. I would really like to see who's assessing this program, how uh, who, uh, this program, the utilization data. Thank you. Okay, yes. So um, I. I don't know that it will come up next time in the accelerator, so I can talk a It will. Okay. <laughs> you um, okay, then I, I will leave it for next time then. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I have a couple of questions. So I, in, when we began this budget process, I, I, I was think, like asking myself, all right, where are the strategic investments that are going to improve our literacy in math? And so I, I see pockets of this. So it's small decisions, right? For example, you chose to create a position to support summer school and tutoring programs, which those are key strategic improvement initiatives. And if you don't have the staff to help coordinate and support them, then they're not going to be effective. So I'm just talking to myself here. But <laughs> trying, trying to understand where the, where the strategic initiatives are all over the budget, as you said, Dr. McKnight, but we do have to highlight the things that are going, that we believe are going to improve uh, literacy and math in this budget. Um, where is professional development in the budget? I think it's in several places, right? Is that in, it's, it's is that more in uh, first chapter? It's in 
project in Japan? I asked because uh, professional development was one of the two and a half year plan strategic initiatives because we said that our teachers really needed support in order to implement the interventions that are academic interventions that our students needed. Uh, and also to the student that hadn't been in person school, it was a different, you know, a third grader that was reading at first grade level. And so I'm very interested either today or next week to fully understand <coughs> where that is in the budget. Is that still a strategic lever that we're pulling in order to see improvements in literacy and math? Go ahead and save the now. Well, I, I can just speak to the professional development that we have going on to support the literacy and math. Um, we are um, providing support first to our school leaders to make sure that they understand what is supposed to be happening as we, as teachers, are planning and delivering instruction in literacy and math, and that our school leaders, our principals, math content coaches, resource teachers, all understand how they support that work in collaborative planning. So there's professional development that we have that takes place uh, in collaboration with other offices um, on a regular basis. That's already in the calendar and it's already budgeted for. It's already in the, yes. And, and so that is uh, a part of the regular work that we do. We also um, provide professional learning to all of our content leaders who support the work taking place in schools. And so um, monthly, professional learning, kind of like a trainer trainer that we provide support to around the content and how to deliver that content. Um, then we provide periodically throughout the school year additional support for our teachers around, take science of reading for example, and then the work there um, to make sure that our teachers have ongoing knowledge and skills that they need throughout the school year. And then our big professional development, of course, is during the summertime, where we um, train thousands of our teachers around um, math literacy and, and other content areas, as well as um, supporting well-being and things of that nature. So most of it happens in the summer, but we have ongoing learning that takes place throughout the school year as well. And the anti-racist professional development is part of the summer training and that's already budgeted? That's actually ongoing at all levels right. um, in response to the audit. Um, we're going through processes ourselves as a leadership team. We're working through that same process with school-based leaders alongside of them as we look at the data and as we do begin to plan um, in response to it. So I think that work is pretty robust right now and ongoing. And I think what you'll see coming out of it are more recommendations of how we might do more professional learning. Just to add on to, I just wanted to say we've been hitting on a lot of the ESSER big buckets. So tutoring is a lot of that is currently in ESSER. Professional development, there's a lot of funding in ESSER, as well as you'll hear about technology too. So those are some areas that are um, you might not see in here because it's currently in ESSER, and you know, based on evaluations, will be migrated to the operating budget this year or next year. And I'd also like to add, there is quite a bit sitting in the operating budget that we've been building over time dedicated towards professional development, quite frankly. Um, and it's in all of the offices. Ms. Hazel was just going through all of that PD that they do. And, it's, and it does continue to be a cornerstone of what we see as one of our most high leverage investments because we know people need to be trained to feel successful, to stay in the jobs that they're in, um, and to implement, whether it may be curriculum or the anti-racist audit findings, all of those things with fidelity. So there's, there's professional development happening that's already designated by staff, given, give, you know, given to other staff from the Office of Curriculum Instruction. In the Office of uh, Strategic Initiatives, we also have professional development um, coming out of that office as it relates to the anti-racist audit. You know, our um, equity and achievements Specialist title, learning yes, energy. learning. No, actually, I was getting to them in a second. Specialist. Instructional specialists in the equity unit um, have been a big part of helping to go out and build the capacity and providing professional development around the anti racist audit. That's already there. Um, learning and achievement specialists in OSSWB, also a big component for providing professional development to schools around school improvement planning. So I, I lay those out because those are all different offices, but there's already staff 
baked into the structure of these offices that are focused on professional development? If it's helpful, it's because it's a great question, Ms. Silvestri. You know, those are things that we can continue to highlight as we come forward and share these chapters because we don't want you or our community for, to forget about that because they're there. Um, last year, just again, focusing on professional development, we implemented, re-implemented the staff development teacher across all schools because we want to make sure the professional development was there and in the schools. And much of the positions that I'm talking about that are central, all of that work's coming through from all those different offices to that staff development teacher to help coordinate the implementation of the work at the schools. You'll hear them um, highlighting some of the realignments or changes that are happening. The uh, wellness coaches, so what we talked about just a little while ago, mm -hmm. those are additions. So um, if, if that helps, I wanted to be able to share how much of it is baked into the structure of how we do our work. We are committed to professional learning um, to all of the staff in the system. And so much of it's there and where we see we, where we, see we need to build, like around wellness, because that's what we're building out, has not been a part of the cornerstone, I would say, of our, our district or many districts probably forever. Now we're establishing and building much of that. Mr. Hull? Yeah, I was just going to add, as Dr. McKnight noted, a lot of the PD, uh, most of it is built into the departments and specifically into the schools themselves as well. Um, but we do also have about $4 million uh, in Chapter 1 set aside for stipends for teachers that actually go out and do the professional development. So there's some there. Uh, and then specifically around the anti-racist work, that is currently on the ESSER 3 grant. So we also have professional development on some, uh, some of our grants. Uh, my final comment or question is um, structured literacy is one of our strategic levers this year. Um, is that already, what, what does that, what does the implementation entail in terms of materials, resources, people power, and why don't we see that as a line item in the budget as either a realignment or a new amount? So we put it in um, last year's budget, and so we purchased all new materials. Um, uh, really Great Reading is the name of the material that we're using. We provided professional development during the summertime, and we're still continuing with that. Um, and so that work continues. Um, you might have heard that we have a request for proposal out for a new literacy curriculum at the elementary level. Um, and so what we want to make sure as we are looking to determine whether or not we replace benchmark is for a curriculum that has a strong foundational skills program. So the instructional materials that we have in the budget um, will support that work. Um, and so that seems to be going very well. We, the initial reports that we had from the schools that piloted last year were very positive. We feel that the implementation seems to be going very well with the structured literacy this year, and um, schools are really making the adjustments. We, um, through a, a different grant, a LEADS grant, we were able to hire three additional literacy coaches to support the work, so we have um, a total of now six people out in school supporting the implementation of our structured literacy program and um, really working with our school leadership, getting into classrooms, observing, um, modeling if necessary, making uh, recommendations and adjustments. So we feel like that the implementation is going, going well. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I think this is what the community wants to see. Like, what do you mm -hmm. think is going to help move the needle on literacy and math? And here is a, a sample of the key initiatives funded in past budgets, funded through grants, funded through ESSER, that are supporting that, that um, strategy. So, all right, let's move on to the next section. We have a recess. Um, how long is our recess, Ms. Right. Ten-minute recess. It is um, 11.50, so let's come back at 12.
And we are not back. <laughs> We are back and resuming our budget work session and continuing, uh, Dr. McKnight, I'll hand it over to you with Chapter 5, Special Education. All right. We can jump right in, Chapter 5. As we transition to Chapter 5, I, I wanted to mention the, the talk about professional learning and where it is in all of the different chapters. It is a significant lever and it will continue to be needed every year, year after year, because we have new staff, we have new leaders, new administrators, new programs, changes to programs, changes to assessments, additional programs. So any investment that you can make into those structures that are baked into the um, existing operating budget and including additional coaches is is an investment in the future um, because it, without that continuous learning process, our teachers, uh, um, they don't have the information that they need about how Montgomery County is approaching teaching and learning. So with that, I'll transition to Diana Wiles. Good afternoon, President Silvestri, Dr. McKnight, board members. My name is Diana Wiles. I'm the acting associate superintendent for the Office of Special Education. <laughs> The mission of the Office of Special Education is to improve the academic, social, emotional, and post-secondary outcomes of our students with disabilities from birth to age 21 and to provide a continuum of services while doing so. This means services in their neighborhood schools, pull out um, opportunities in their schools through uh, placements in our non-public schools that we partner with. We work uh, collaboratively with several offices in coordinating and monitoring the provision of those services for our students with disabilities. And we do this work through an anti-racist lens and with equity in mind. We are uh, directly supporting the strategic priorities of academic excellence, well-being and family engagement, and professional and operational excellence. Okay, next slide. I haven't gotten any. <laughs> um, as it relates to um, racial equity, we are focused on two goals. One is to ensure that we are not over-identifying our students of color um, with uh, emotional disabilities and cognitive disabilities. And the second is to reduce disproportionality in suspensions and discipline of students of color. Uh, we work closely with the Office of Curriculum and Instruction to ensure our students with disabilities are provided opportunities for inclusion with their non-disabled peers. Our central office staff and Office of Special Education works closely with our school teams to support them in ensuring that they are being provided job and better professional um, development opportunities, assistance in challenging cases, and ensuring that they understand how to provide specially designed instruction. Next slide. The salaries and wages for um, the Office of Special, Edu Special Education are used to support the five divisions or departments within special education. The uh, first is the Department of Special Education Services, where our six supervisors, instructional specialists, um, itinerant resource teachers work directly with the schools to support um, our teachers and administrators in the implementation of special education and related services. The Division of pre-kindergarten special programs and related services, supports our PEP programs, as well as works with the uh, Montgomery County Infants and Toddlers Program. The Division of Business, Fiscal, and Information Systems uh, provides support with the num numerous grants that support our work. Our Resolution and Compliance Unit works with uh, families where there may be complaints um, as it relates to the provision of services. They also support training to ensure that we maintain compliance with state and federal law. And finally, our Central Processing, uh, Central Placement Unit uh, serves to assist with uh, placements of students who may not be able to uh, receive the services in a traditional special, uh, special education public school program. Um, our contract contractual services include funding for the provision of our related services, such as contracting for speech and language 
occupational therapy and physical therapy services, as well as um, the funding for our Type 2 Foundation School, which is housed at Blair Ewing um, and supports the continuum of services for students who are um, unable to be provided the services in a traditional school program. Supplies and materials budget includes instructional materials for our infants and toddlers program, which services our students from birth to three. The other category represents funding for our non-public school placements. Again, a support program for students who may need more intensive and highly structured programming outside the public school setting. And uh, the equipment uh, budget is in order to support the Parent Resource Center, which is one of the accelerators that we'll talk about uh, further next week. Next slide. Within the special education department, we have projected growth of approximately 895 students, which has um, requires us to increase our instructional materials uh, budget to support schools so that they can ensure that they are able to purchase materials for our students. Um, similarly, with infants and with our infants and toddlers program, we're projecting about 100 student increase, um, and we are increasing staffing for our infants and toddlers programming. Um, at th uh, three classroom teachers, speech, patho uh, speech pathologists, PT and OT um, related service providers. Um, within the budget, we do have a reduction of $2 million for our non-public placements. Um, this is not reflective of a decrease in the need. Rather, it is reflective of the fact that the non-publics are having similar issues with regard to staffing. So the uh, rate at which we were able to get students placed in non-publics has reduced because they have the same challenges with ensuring that they have staffing to keep, um, to continue to uh, have students enrolled in their programming. Repeat that again. I think people need to hear that. Say that again one more time if you don't mind. Certainly, certainly. Um, while we have been able to reduce our budget in our non-public placements, it is not the result of there being a decrease in the need for students. Rather, it is a result of the non-public schools having the same challenges as the public schools with placing students. So unlike the public school system, non-publics can refuse uh, an enrollment. And they are refusing enrollments um, or rejecting enrollments because they don't have the staffing. Next, next slide. Within the Office of Special Education, um, we have realigned a position from a uh, fiscal specialist to a fiscal supervisor. And this is the result of the need for in in increased contractual services. So this position is going to not only help with ensuring um, f the fiscal responsibilities of the Office of Special Education, ensuring that we meet maintenance of effort, but uh, the position is also going to be managing and working with procurement on the contractual needs that we currently have. We've also uh, realigned funds from Chapter 1 to Chapter 5 for translation of IEPs. Federal law requires us to uh, translate into native languages of, of uh, populations who um, would otherwise, uh, who, who need to be able to read it in their native language. Um, so we have taken some funds from Chapter 5 that were surplus and we're using it for that support. Additionally, um, we have re realigned positions from Chapter 1 to Chapter 5 for our Model Learning Center. The Model Learning Center is the program for our students who are incarcerated in the Montgomery County Correctional Facility. We are required to continue, and we do continue to provide them services, educational services. So we have uh, staffing at the Model Learning Center that is supported um, centrally. Next. 
Next slide. In this budget, we have um, a reduction of $400,000 in the medical assistance program grant funding. Um, and while, uh, with regard to the non-public placements, we were able to reduce the amount of $2 million, we still have a projected increase rate of, for the tuition. Um, as we have been un unable to place all of our students as we would like to in non-publics that students that need it, um, the tuition rates continue to go up. And they are going up approximately at a rate of 7.5%. Um, we have small reductions um, in efficiencies of 62,500 uh, 62, um, with regard to contractual service and t services, textbooks, uh, travel, mileage, and that may be due to um, some challenges with some of the contractual services where while we are working with multiple agencies to meet the need of uh, providing those related services, at times it's been challenging to get those, um, those uh, positions filled. So we've been able to reduce due to some vacancies. Next slide. Very good. So if my colleagues have any questions, uh, please turn your light on. If not, we can continue. And you can always, if you think of something, we can always go back and, and ask. Ms. Evans. I had a quick question. So um, you mentioned in under contractual services that we reduced some positions because it was hard for them to feel, but it doesn't mean that we don't need the positions, right? So um, at what time would we be able to, f so since we're removing that funding, because we can't fill them, even though we know we need to fill them, when we need to fill them, are we going to be okay with being able to fill them, although the money is no longer in that budget? So it was a small amount that we, um, I understand. That we reduced. We still have, uh, we've actually increased been able to partner with Frederick County and a contract okay. that they have for agencies. So we're still meeting that need. Sure. Um, if there, if we are able to meet it, then to, to the extent that we can identify surplus funds okay. in our budget, we're using surplus funds to cover those costs. To cover the cost in the future or to cover the cost with um, our uh, collaboration with Frederick County. I'm sorry. I Cover the cost when we. So what happens is we do. We have this um, contract that you all approved. Um, sure. Right. Uh, recently, mm -hmm. um, as we identify vacancies, we reach out to the agencies and say we need a speech pathologist. And um, if they're able to cover it, then um, we're billed monthly, okay. and we we're able to identify surplus funds if we have those positions, if gotcha. we don't have those positions, or they don't have people for us to fill those positions, then um, the the position stays open and, okay. and we continue to advertise internally, but also reach out to other agencies. I got you. And I, and I was not implying that we're not doing the work. <laughs> Just to be clear. Right? Okay. Ms. Harris? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so I very much appreciate how you started out this presentation by saying we are really working intentionally to make sure we're not over-identifying our students of color. And we are really working very intentionally to make sure our uh, special needs students aren't overrepresented in our student discipline work. Um, and part of that, I think, is that you know sometimes our, our students with special needs can exhibit challenging behaviors. And you know, if, if, if staff, teacher doesn't know how to recognize, acknowledge, and, and, and sort of manage those behaviors, the default can be discipline. So are we, it would professional development for, to help students, or to help um, our educators um, sort of understand and, and know and, and, and build their strategies to, to support students um, in their behavioral challenges, would that be in your office or would that be somebody else? It's collaborative. So we work with um, OSSWB, um, and particularly we have a, a grant, um, the CCEIS grant, um, that supports the specific work of disproportionality. 
um, for over identification and for discipline. Um, and we work closely with um, our, our partners in OSSWB to identify schools that may be demonstrating um, higher numbers of uh, suspensions so that we can work with them to reduce those suspension numbers. Um, in, within that grant, we have targeted schools, but we can also always, and we do extend those numbers if the numbers in other schools begin to creep up. Um, we also um, do training within the Office of Special Education in de-escalation strategies, and we've expanded that, sh that training to um, more staff this year and intend to increase that uh, de-escalation training for other staff. Thank you. And I'd love to hear more about the CTEIS grant, but, you know, we, we can connect. I'd certainly like to get, yeah. Um, and you mentioned our model learning center um, where we're serving our incarcerated students. Do we have information on how well that instructional model is working to support those students? Um, so I don't have data here. I can certainly um, come back to the board with that information. Um, the, the challenge is that we service a very specific population of incarcerated students in the Montgomery County Correctional Facility. It is students who are incarcerated in adult facilities. And so it's a transient um, population of students because we're servicing them as they're moving through the correctional um, correctional process. So some of those students may stay there for a period of days or weeks or months. Um, others may be sent to the juvenile services um, programming, um, or they may be released. So keeping data is a, little bit, is a little bit more challenging for that population of students because it truly is a um, moving target in terms of how long they will be there and how long um, we'll be providing the services. The other um, issue with that is that we are uh, truly beholden to the facility. Mm -hmm. So our student, our um, staff members are there and they are supporting. Um, but if anything happens at the facility, um, we we are not able to access our students. Um, we have you know we have to abide by the rules of the facility. Um, and everything you just said, I think, illustrates why that work's so important. So, um, and then the last question I had, just a clarifying question on slide 23. There was a mention of a medical assistant program grant. What's that? Mm -hmm. the medical assistance grant is the um, we call it the Medicaid uh, students who are Medicaid eligible. So for our students who re who are eligible for Medicaid. Um, the school system is able to bill for the services that are provided. Um, speech path if the student gets speech and language services, speech pathologists can bill for those services. Um, we can bill for academic services. And once that billing is completed, um, it goes back into the school system's budget, provides for um, and supports uh, all of our students. OK. OK, thank you. That's interesting. So I know um, Delegate <laughs> Charcutian is working on a bill to change some of Maryland's sort of Medicaid policy structure so that um, the same thing for Medicaid eligible students, we can um, be reimbursed for wellness services. So um, interesting. Thank you very much. Ms. Roberta Oven. Thank you. Um, just a quick follow up on, on what um, Ms. Harris was saying. So that, that funding would be, for example, to cover like all day nursing, like if they need assistance, that if the student has the uh, Medicaid? The Medicaid, yeah. So the funding itself doesn't go directly to a specific service. What it allows the district to do is to be reimbursed for a portion of the service that was received. Okay. So in other words, I, I, a student could get, uh, could have the services of a PDN. Mm -hmm. And if that student is Medicaid eligible, then the, we could submit to the state for a portion of the billing to come back to the district to support programming. Um, so sometimes a lot of these things are connected. So I'm trying to think, um, uh, you mentioned that you, you were increasing uh, funding for uh, translation for the IEPs because you have seen an increase in need. 
which then tells me there's an increase of children whose English is not the first language, right? So I guess my question is, um, out of the, the population of the 20,000 students, which is right around, I think that's approximately. Okay, approximately. Um, it would, I would be interested to know um, the breakdown, right, of uh, the students who, who, are, uh, who are identified, uh, ESOL and so on, and just demographically where the concentrations are, if there are any. Um, and how this fits with the wellness trainers that we were talking about, because um, many of these families, you know, the children are usually born here, they're U.S. citizens, sometimes they don't know how to access Medicaid or where to go and so on and, and how all this fits in, because it benefits the district, right? If, if uh, otherwise the district still has to provide it, without that benefit. So I'm just thinking that, you know, how, how are we working on, on, on that area? Um, and then the other thing that I was uh, just con concerned about was what you, you were talking about the non-public placements. You know, I never thought of this, but um, how does, well, you know, how, how bad is the issue? Like, like, give me a number, you know, just say to me, Grace, we know that you know we're serving, but now you know there's this increase, and and you're right. Other institutions have the right to say no, you know, because we cannot provide that because we don't we have shorts of staff. So I'm just trying to grasp how um, bad the situation is, and so what happens with that? I mean, we have to still provide this education, correct? So what's the process for that? What does it look like to to, to the system. Um, and then you mentioned something that we're going outside the system for pathology services sometimes because we don't have them. I think everybody's feeling that pinch. But did you say we're using another school district? Did I hear that right? I'm sorry, I was writing notes and trying um, to, to listen at the same time. Certainly. <laughs> and then lastly, with the young people who are incarcerated, right, there is this whole thing of, um, Ensuring that once they, you know, they go through that, they usually end up in the Department of Juvenile Justice and DOJ. I'm just trying to think to follow through on it, like the information that you get at the end. How does that work? Do we have a good grasp on it? So that way that transition, you know, and, and, and I don't think things have changed from, from when I was working in this field 30 years ago much. We, we just do not invest in this population the way we should. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, the hurdles that you have to go through, right? And if there's anything to, to make it better. So I'm, I'm going to try my best to cover all of you, but if I miss something, Sorry. please. No, no, it's, no, it's fine. Please let me know if I, if I don't um, answer a question. With regard to incarcerated students, there, because there's so many different pathways and um, potential outcomes, um, we do have a court liaison who is um, an MCPS employee. All of the LEAs have a similar position, and that person's responsibility is to work with the courts, with the Juvenile Services um, Division, to monitor and track students so that we don't lose track of where students are in the process. Um, to clarify, with the contract, so what we're able to do um, as a public school system is to um, piggyback off of another school system's contract. So Frederick County has um, has contracted with a, mo a number of agencies for different services related to special education. We also have uh, contracts that we competitively bid it. Um, as we started to exhaust the list of agencies that were awarded on our contract, we've reached out to our um, to other LEAs to see if they had already contracted through through competitive bids with agencies that we were not currently using. And what we were able to do, um, I believe we have something like 25 or 30 agencies that are on a contract that we bid it. Frederick County has some additional agencies that they competitively bid it. And because of the relationship 
um, amongst the school systems, we're able to utilize that contract to support our work. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, the non-publics, the, the question of how, how bad it is, I think, is relative to where you sit um, in the process. Um, we have approximately 20 to 25 students who we have, um, we continue to try to find placements for um, relative to the number, 20,000 or so students that we have that does not seem like a, a large number. However, um, this means that we have students who may have some very significant challenges who are still in a public school program. And so our, our central office staff does a lot of work to support those programs where we have students where we've identified that they have a very specific set of needs, that they would be better served. Um, and we try to serve all of our students, but um, the non-publics exist you know, for this specific reason. Um, so when we cannot find a placement, when we've exhausted um, the non-public referral process. Um, our central office staff goes out, they support, they provide training, um, and we're constantly troubleshooting and problem solving how we can continue to support the students um, when we hit that barrier. <coughs> but we're also still communicating with our non-public schools because they do have um, movement in their programming because we're, um, referring students to schools that Prince George's County, um, Howard County, that, you know, the surrounding counties are also referring to. So students may move in and out. And through our central uh, placement unit, they are constantly monitoring that so that when uh, placements open up, we can provide those services to our students. Thank you. And, and just for the future, I, I just would like to kind of get an idea of our student population um, demographically, if they're if they are also ESOL um, involved and so on. And um, if you know quickly, that court liaison you were talking about, I'm just curious on the caseload that that person carries yearly, if you know. I, I don't know. But oh, that would know, be, be great to know. Thank you. Um, Ms. Wiles, just one quick question. Uh, the enrollment, the projected enrollment increase of 895 students in the department, is that pretty steady? I, because I am fair, still fairly new to this position, I don't know what the um, rate of increase has been over the last couple of years. I can, um, I can certainly find that out and uh, inform the board. What I can say is that our projections in, at this time of the year, are, are truly just projections. When we come back, um, we oftentimes get an influx of students for various reasons. People moving into the district because of um, our wonderful programs, um, particularly for our students with autism. We have families that move into Montgomery County for that reason. So um, while we project now, we oftentimes have a greater number in, this, um, in the fall. Just made your comment. Thank you. Yep. So I want to make one quick comment. Um, Dr. Gwendolyn Mason was in the position formally, but I just like when you come and sit at the table. I feel like you've been in this position for several years. My goodness. So <laughs> thank you <laughs> for the work that you've done in such a short period of time. Did you start in July? Like, did you get the switch over? When was it? When did Dr. Mason? I, I can't remember. As, as Dr. Mason um, uh, went out in July. I started in this position. Prior to that, I was in the Resolution and Compliance Unit as a right. supervisor. Okay. I just want everybody to know it's been a very short period of time. It's not been a year. So I appreciate you. what you've done and what and, you're doing. And Ms. Evans, just to add on to that, um, Ms. Wiles had just come to the district uh, as that compliance officer maybe a year. October of uh, 20... What year is this now? 21. <laughs> 21. Yes, exactly, because COVID has 21. done that. 21. So she actually had only been here a year in that position, which she came highly recommended. But I just wanted to, to, to reiterate, while we're here talking about the budget and talk about the numbers, um, I am so impressed when Ms. Rivera Oven, you asked a question about the number of students we have and you know, recommended for non-placements. You said it was about 20,000, roughly around 20,000. For non-publics, about non 20, I'm sorry. 20, 25. 20, 25. 20, 25 students, excuse me, out of the total 
Out of the 20,000? Right. Okay. So I just want to say how you were able to definitively give us that number or that range of a number just speaks to the personalization um, that you know about the students and the need in an office that's so critically important to students who need an advocate to know them individually like that. So I just want to compliment you on that. Um, as you know, that question was raised, I just thought that was just spoke to the personalization that you take into the work and the students that you serve. So thank you. We can continue. With the next presentation. So that's a projection. She must yes. be saying the current state. Correct. That's right. So that means mm -hmm. out of that. They've been able to place them. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Sharon. I'm the Chief of Strategic Initiatives. And uh, before I go into our actual budget, I would like just to take a moment to provide a brief overview of our office. If we could go to the next slide. So the purpose of the Office of Strategic Initiatives is to lead innovation across all offices to ensure effective, anti-racist, and equitable outcomes for students, staff, and families. And it is not by accident that these four um, areas all exist in the Office of Strategic Initiatives. So within our office, we have technology, all the technology departments, shared accountability, the Equity Initiatives Unit, and a Department of District-Wide Professional Learning. And they are all together in the Office of Strategic Initiatives in order to give us the strategic levers to work together to support the districts in its efforts to break down silos and implement anti-racist and inclusive practices and policies. Examples of how we do this um, is around the work on the board's strategic plan, as well as the um, implementation and coordination of the anti-racist system audit action planning. As you know, the final report for the anti-racist audit states that MCPS needs to focus on coherence, accountability for our racial equity work, equity-centered capacity building, continuous data collection, and relational trust. The Office of Strategic Initiatives is leading the coordination of that work. Through our technology offices of business and information systems, digital innovation, infrastructure and operations, and student data systems, our office develops and supports technology solutions that streamline processes, support equitable teaching and learning, and engage families in two-way communication. It's important to note that this is the first time in MCPS modern history, I will say, um, past 20, 25 years, that the technology offices have actually reported to the academic side of the house and not just the operational component of the house. And while there is uh, a definite component to the operational impact of technology, the vision as we are moving towards the future um, that the district has is that technology is going to serve as an accelerator of access, opportunity, and achievement. So being on the academic side of that house allows for more streamlined collaboration and coordination with our partners in schools, special education, and curriculum. Through our Office of Shared Accountability, we support staff to improve their practices across the district in data-driven decision-making and program evaluation, aligned with the MCPS strategic priorities and the strategic plan. And the Equity Initiatives Unit is supporting and collaborating with every office, as well as student, staff, and community organizations to develop our comprehensive action plan to address the findings of the anti-racist audit. And lastly, our district-wide professional learning department is serving as, as the lead office in cross office, uh, creating a cross office team that is implementing professional learning for all central office and school based leaders to ensure that everyone has the foundational skills necessary to be effective, anti racist, and culturally responsive leaders. Next slide, please. So on this slide, you can see that the biggest areas of the budget allocated to strategic initiatives are in salaries and wages and contractual services. While all of the departments that fall under strategic initiatives utilize contractual services, the vast majority of our budget comes from the technology department. 
Um, most of that contractual service is a large chunk of nearly approximately $10 million, includes our ERP projects, our enterprise resource planning that includes our business hub, our financial hub, as well as our upcoming human capital management project. Additionally, um, Strategic Initiatives is charged with maintaining and upgrading all of the district-wide technology platforms. This includes financial systems, payroll, human resources, but also student data, learning management systems, and communication systems. Some examples of these are Performance Matters, Naviance, Blackboard, Connect Ed, Canvas, Synergy, and Zoom. In the other category, this is largely made up of the cost of our telecommunications work, our cell phones, our internet connections, our telephone costs. And then you also see in the equipment, under the equipment cost, $9.6 million allocated for equipment. And this includes funding for replacement of our interactive panels and the continued support for the refresh of our one-to-one -one student Chromebooks. These items are accelerators and will be discussed in more depth at next week's accelerator budget discussion. However, I did want to point those out to you today as a component of the budget. Next slide, please. So there were a number of realignments um, within the Office of Strategic Initiatives. The Department of District-Wide Professional Learning is a new department this year. Um, so as part of that realignment, and these were all budget neutral realignments, um, were made to create this department, including a 1.0 director position, as well as a 1.0 um, admin secretarial position and as well as some funding for training, supplies, et cetera, that would go into the, the building out of this department. As stated previously, um, and as, we, as you heard from uh, Dr. Pugh, we know that professional learning is something that exists in every office and across the board. And while um, most other offices, they provide that content-specific and role-specific training, in the Department of District-Wide Professional Learning, their charge is really to provide professional learning and coordinate the professional learning that requires cross-office collaboration to establish coherence in service uh, to meeting our district priorities. An example of this is the central services um, learning progression that is being built out as a result of the anti-racist audit findings. We coordinate as well the design and delivery of professional learning required for all employees and establish and implement professional learning standards in this department, structures and processes that will be used across the system that support professional learning. So you almost want to think of it as the, um, as the umbrella to create that coherence and standard across professional learning while in every single office there is content specific professional learning occurring. Another. Um, Realignment was in the Department of Digital Innovation, where we realigned two technology implementation specialists from the Department of Student and Data Systems. So we just moved uh, two from one department to the other. And the rationale for that was as we think about how instructional technology serves as an accelerator for equity, these specialists are charged as part of the examination and build out of innovative technology within the classrooms. Um, an example of this would be uh, our teacher device show case that we had uh, about a week ago where we really started um, kind of showing the different options that can exist. And this is also in partnership with our partners in the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs as well. And lastly, we had an alignment in the Department of Shared Accountability, and that alignment was to create an additional specialist, instructional specialist position in order to support the need for our program evaluations that we know are a critical component um, of our district's plan. For rate changes, our rate changes totaled uh, approximately 1.2 million, and again, um, this largely, uh, this all came out of our contractual maintenance services, and this was largely from the technology component. Our supply chain, as well as inflation costs, have dramatically impacted our contractual maintenances and services around our technology, as well as our overall cost for subscriptions that we have to pay for per student. Those have, have increased, and while we negotiate excellent pricing with our vendors, um, we are seeing increases across a number of our platforms. 
And then lastly, we get to it efficiencies. Um, the 1.0 position is a, an ASM position, um, admin services manager position that was in the office. And after we took a look at our operational efficiencies, that was a vacant position we decided to, to eliminate. And um, we had about $821,000 of efficiencies and reductions. Um, although we had reductions across the departments, most of the reductions came out of the technology portion of the budget. And they came from contractual services, some TPT, supplies. What we did to accomplish these reductions is we did analyze prior year expenditures and prioritized future dollars, mostly aligned to our work moving forward. So an example of this is, is we had a program called WebEx, which you may or may not be familiar with. It is a, um, like, a like a Zoom very little utilization, and we have another platform that does the same thing. So we took a look at a number of those types of, of things, as well as took a look at supplies, et cetera, in order to reduce. Next slide, please. And at this point, I will turn it over to the board for discussion. Okay, well, thank you very much. I will ask my colleagues if you have any questions. Uh, please turn your light on. Ms. Harris. <coughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a couple of questions. So um, as uh, several folks have talked about today, um, as we're moving forward, there is a very much an enhanced expectation on the board, by, uh, from the board that we're really accountable for how we're spending our dollars and are the programs that we're spending them on, the initiatives that we're ramping up, are they actually achieving the goals? So, you know, accountability, um, monitoring, evaluating. And so does most of that, or what's the role of, of the office, the, I guess you call it a department, we just call it office now, Department of Shared Accountability, in coordinating that work across the system? It's a great question. So they are integral in coordinating that work, um, and there is a cycle of program evaluation that that office conducts. And what the, we do is we actually look at what programs are new pilots, right? What are established programs? Um, and what are programs that might be, have been implemented one or two years, we know they're big budget items, for instance. And we go on a, like a, a cycle of where we evaluate. Um, every year, we have a list of programs that get evaluated and then get sent up to the board. So that is an ongoing process that we're evaluating. And I believe Dr. McKnight actually highlighted last night in her presentation that, you know, some of the data that we have typically used pri prior to pandemic through the, the Department of Shared Accountability, we haven't had access to. It's kind of been a little bit of a black hole with some of our data components because of the nature of the pandemic, but we're getting back to that. Um, and we're going to be able to access a lot more of that data. Um, so that is a primary task to work with not only all of the offices and educating them on what the program evaluation process is, but also conducting the evaluations. And I also want to point out something that I think is really integral in something that Dr. McKnight has been and the district has been really emphasizing, though, is although we definitely take the lead in a lot of data analysis, as you see at the board in the, in the Department of Shared Accountability, as well as actually developing the program, this is shared work across the entire district of every office. So part of the work of this office, um, of the Office of Shared Accountability, is creating the knowledge and understanding across all spaces on how to look at data, how to evaluate programming so it's not just in one space, that people have that mindset going into their work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and this may go to Mr. Riley, um, but you know, your pie chart was a little, it was like, whoa, that operate, you know, the, the contractual services piece is huge. Um, and the ERP project, so I know this has been work that you've been very, very involved in, and it's work to bring us sort of into the 21st century and align all of our systems across offices so for efficiency, but could you just give a little update what that is, where we are, and sort of so people have some context for that contractual services piece. Yeah, sure. So that project, the ERP project, now is in the HCM phase, human capital management phase, uh, which looks at one of the things that we've been saying is we're going to get away from paper timesheets. So that's the uh, <laughs> that, that's the long-term goal. Uh, but the project started pre-COVID, and we started with the uh, accounting and those pieces at uh, first. And one thing I'd like to add about the accounting piece, we did look at our chart of accounts, and we keep talking about our program budget. So we do have a field in that chart of accounts that's going to make that easier, a function or a program field. That's kind of um, kind of help uh, automate that when we get to that point. Um, but right now we're in that last phase, and the uh, right now the projected go live is one one twenty four. Uh, we're evaluating right now where we stand with that, um, but we're 
you know, within a year of, of uh, getting this, within a year or a year and a half of getting this total project done. And like you said, this is going to be all inclusive with all our financial systems. So just coming attractions forward, you know, forward thinking, you know, looking ahead. So once this is, this process is completed, so are we looking at, you know, the, here we are looking at, um, what, 28.4 million in contractual services. Is that going to be like an opportunity for us? Are these costs that, that that project is done, those contractual services are no longer needed, and so that's there's going to be a, so some of that money is for uh, implementation, but some of it is ongoing costs. Um, so I, I do believe there is going to be some opportunities where we can, you know, when we come to next year or the year after to realign, there'll be opportunities there. But a lot of that money is ongoing. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then the last question I have um, sort of ties into a piece of testimony that we had last night from a, a teacher at Sligo Middle School. And she was mentioning, uh, one of the things that she mentioned was that um, a, a, an, an academic resource platform that a lot of teacher uses, and when she said it, I knew what she was talking about, now I can't remember. Active Inspire. Active Inspire was not compatible with smart boards. And that made me, <clears throat> so thinking on two things back um, when I was um, teaching at Edison, and in, at the start of 2020, we moved into the new Synergy Canvas platform and you know, the, a, a whole bunch of us that had used one sort of classroom to a platform was not compatible, and I was in that group that had to adapt all of my uh, materials and everything, all the way that I did my work to the platform that was supported. And so thinking as we're talking about the device showcase, how are we making sure that as we're giving some choice, which I think is good, and we're really bringing <laughs> our teachers to the table and our, our prior educators to the table to look at devices so they really have tools that work for them because we're not all the same. How are we making sure that um, educators don't come up to that kind of cliff again? What you've done you can't do anymore because there's the lack of compatibility. So I'm so glad you asked that question because it really directly aligns to why we now have our technology offices on the academic side of the house, right? We cannot exist in isolation as the nuts and bolts. It has to be integrated. And I also want to highlight what you just said around technology is always rapidly changing. We might not be able to prevent the fact that there's going to be outdated technologies that we're going to constantly have to figure out new and innovative solutions in. And that gets to what we were talking about regarding professional learning and how critical that is going to be to marry the professional learning around technology with the content in the curriculum with which we are teaching, because it has to be part of that. Our, this is also one of the reasons that we have this year a new Department of Digital Innovation. Their whole job in that department is to do exactly what you're saying. We have a team of over nine instructional technology implementation specialists that work side by side with the schools. They provide professional learning to staff development teachers. They're deployed to schools. They work with curriculum folks in order to make sure that, that these transitions are seamless. Because we know how frustrating it can be, too, for teachers. You bring up Active Inspire. Active Inspire is a Promethean-owned software. It's a 20-year-old technology. What we can use using the interactive panels is much more robust, but it is incumbent upon us to make sure we're providing the professional learning for teachers so that they know how to use it and can integrate integrate it seamlessly, and that is what the Department of Digital Innovation is charged with doing. Yeah, I think that's great, because I think the key in, you know, we can all adapt, right? We can all develop that resilience, but when you don't have the mm -hmm. the, the runway, and it's, it's it, so I think what you're talking about is ensure that there is, even when technologies are going to, are, are, you know, as you said, licensed to a, a vendor we're no longer using, or that's now outdated and we need to migrate and evolve, that that's not, uh, no surprises. For our staff, so they have the, the time to make those changes instead of not having the time. Thank you, Ms. Roberta Oven. Thank you um, so much. I'm, I'm learning a lot, and I'm, one of the things that I'm learning is that when you look at, at technology, you just think of technology, but you guys are tasked with a lot more than just technology, which is one of the things a lot of people bringing bringing up to the table is the whole engagement of stakeholders. Yes. Right, and and you guys are the driven force. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you guys are the driven force in order for that to happen effectively and deliberately when it comes to engagement and communication with our families, our students, and our teachers. 
um, and even, you know, uh, the folks who support the school system. So a couple of things that uh, caught my eye. I, um, by no means, I'm not an expert in technology, so please take this with a grain of salt. But when I'm looking um, at some of the positions that you guys created with that new office, uh, which, by the way, I think is great, um, there, uh, one of the positions is the Department of, of Share Accountability mm -hmm. underneath it that is, uh, and, and I'm just wondering, is that person, is this 1.0 instructional specialist position, and, and then is this $35,000 for contractual services to provide expertise and support to schools with assessment data? I, is that for all 210 schools? Because that's asking a lot of whoever that, whoever's going to be doing that job. No, no, no. I, okay, absolutely. Okay. And I think, you know, what you will see in general in the Office of Strategic Initiatives is that we don't necessarily have this huge staff. Right. But that's also strategic in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Because what our job is is to build the capacity of others to be able to then deliver out some of these things that will have a huge impact on the board's strategic plan. So regarding that, we do have um, an an instructional specialist, and then we, that, that $35,000 also that was realigned um, for the data uh, contracting is that's where we're really providing some professional learning around performance matters. Talked about it a little bit at the board table at the last meeting. And that is really the tool that teachers and uh, district leaders and principals across the board utilize to help make data-driven decisions. So it's about kind of that trainer of training models that we, we deploy, because clearly one person can not provide targeted support to 210 schools. But it's about building building the capacity of everyone. Awesome. I think that is great. I think we're moving in the right direction, like we were talking about building little by little. Um, and uh, lastly, um, are, are you going to be able to make our web better? <laughs> like, out, of, out of all this, so. I mean, we, hear, we hear quite a lot of issues, including today I was, I was chuckling to myself with, because one of my colleagues had an issue with trying to pay online and accessing the web, and it was very challenging. So you know if it's challenging for one of us, it has to be challenged for many thousands of parents that are out there, and then you add other, you know, components, you know, uh, to it. So, so I just, I just want to, you know, I think um, we all want to know, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and we are a huge system, and I understand that. But there's just some practicalities that need to come into it. So I'm just wondering what the, the plan is. Yes, that's a, that's a great question. And, and what I, I tend to joke about sometimes is that... Um, People think if it's on the internet, it all automatically was was done by the by the technology offices. But the reality is, is that this is really all all, all departments are, are kind of utilizing this, uploading this. So the web services team is is under the communications department. But what we're working with them collaboratively on is exactly what you're saying. How do we create a more robust experience? And actually, it has really been great. We've started some initial conversations and just the brainstorming of how we can work together. Um, um, between communications and um, Office of Strategic Initiatives on doing that. So that is uh, a project well underway. We also have some intermediary things. You know, one of the things that we have heard a lot, and when you talked about, I believe before, we talked about uh, engaging with the community. You know, we've heard a lot over the past few years, especially with the, you know, after the pandemic with the influx of technology, Synergy, Canvas, GoFan, My School Bus. Like, we have been kind of hearing a lot of concerns around this, and we have done some really strategic things to try to target what we can do to make improvements. One of the things that we're exploring high level is single sign-on. We hear that there's too many sign-ons to different platforms on our on our internet. Um, we're looking at two, but we're in the process of, of seeing if we can consolidate into single sign-on, which, which would be hugely helpful for our community. Um, we have heard a lot of um, information about how we can improve two-way communication and consolidate some of our communication tools. So we're going to be working on a pilot. It, um, this spring around doing that. Um, around synergy activation and parent view, one of the things that we are working on is we have met with our community numerous times. We're working with the international office. We are working with our PPCs, our PPWs. We've done drop-in sessions. We work with individual schools, and we've actually increased our parent um, utilization of parent view, uh, both activation and utilization from 78% in August to 83% by December. So we're making gains there. Um, and then we're constantly analyzing our utilization data and disaggregating it to see what communities we're not hitting, and then figuring out 
strategically school by school, how do we do that? Because although we have a lot of the technology solutions for two-way communication, we don't own two-way communication and technology. We really need to make sure that we're working collaboratively across offices on how to maximize that work. I, I just want to say thank you so much for answering my other question, which was about the parent view, and I think that it's absolutely great. Um, and um, I, I, I heard Dr. McKnight say that, you know, technology is one of those accelerators for our communities, especially our communities of color. And I just want to reiterate that the work that you're doing is very, very vital to equity. Um, and I think it needs to be kind of also looked with that, with that lens that this is equity work yes. at its best. And because um, when we think of technology, we're like, well, you know, let's, but it's, it's vital to what we're trying to achieve because if we don't have um, access for these families and students and teachers, you know, then we were creating an equity barrier yes. and issue in it. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And the last thing I'm going to ask is um, what is, you know, or maybe it's not for this or for the future, but what's the plan <clears throat> on ensuring that the students and, 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 the, and the families are involved in coming up, you know, with some of those strategies that you guys are trying to do in order um, to hear from the community what works best for them when it comes to um, all this about technology and access. And, and I want you to know that's how we're building our technology solutions from the ground up, um, is focusing first on what the community needs. So we've been engaging in focus groups. We've been going out to PTA groups. We've been working with individual staff at schools because we need to make sure that whatever technology solutions that we're implementing are not only user friendly for the different parts of our community, right, but that our staff are going to be able to utilize it as well. So as we engage our stakeholders robustly, it has to be a multi-prong approach in order to address that. So all of our technology solutions are starting with that. And then also making sure that we're working cross office so that we're not just adding technology and then it becomes overwhelming, but how are we consolidating and making it supposed to, you're not supposed to see technology. When you don't hear from us, that means we're doing a good job usually um, because it should be easy, user friendly and intuitive. So we always start with our community. Ms. Sharon, I just want to thank you for elevating that across um, office work because the web is a perfect example of that. And also, um, I'll ask the board to stay tuned to our next communications and community engagement um, work session or committee meeting because um, Ms. Fisher, our assistant chief of communications, uh, she has shared and will continue to share the rollout plan for revamping the web overall. We've gotten a lot of feedback from our community, and she, along with uh, other members from teams like Ms. Sharon um, from the technology team have uh, really, and our senior community advisor, um, Alba Garcia, have really talked about what needs to be on that website, how do we know what's important to all stakeholders, our students, our parents, and our staff to make it user friendly for them, and most importantly, a timeline of us basically revamping the entire website, cleaning it up. We've heard there are, I understand, thousands maybe hundreds, a thousand pages, I'm not sure, um, but a lot. And so that's a big part of, of why they're going to do a, a revamp of the entire thing. And I know that there have been conversations about us being very intensive over that over the summer um, and expecting, a, I believe, a fall rollout. Yes. But they will give more specifics in the next communication and um, community yes. engagement Thank committee meeting. Thank you. On that note, I really uh, appreciate, you know, this is um, much anticipated and needed. Um, one thing uh, is the consistency of terminologies that we use across the board. Uh, if you go on our different schools' websites, they might label the same thing with a different term so that one people from different community looking for information. For example, uh, some school will call special education teachers under the special education label. There will be, the headline will be the teachers listed. In other schools, you will say resource. So if I am a parent moving from one school or I have students in different schools, I'm completely lost and might need to make a phone call to the office, say, who or, or, you know, so the consistency across the school, because our schools are in charge of putting on, providing contact, so, but the consistency is important in that regard. Thank you, Ms. Thank you.
All right, I think uh, we're almost done. I wanted to ask a process question in terms of the follow-ups that we've been, uh, the board has asked during these budget work sessions. Um, what's your timeline in terms of getting us the first budget work sessions and the things that emerge from this um, work session? So, so the first work session, there was three questions that came out. Of, those are in the final review stage. Um, and then we'll move on to the questions that came out of the hearing. Um, just to uh, let the other new board members know the process. So you'll get a, a booklet with those uh, questions that came out of each one and then uh, in you know, in hard copy, but they'll also be posted online as well, too, as well as all the other board questions from the last 10 years are up online as well, too. Okay, we just want to make sure we get them in time to fin conclude our budget deliberation process. Um, Understood. So you'll get the first batch today, um, and then the, <clears throat> excuse me, the ones from the hearing, the second batch, uh, we will send by the end of this week. And then the ones that come out of last night and today, we'll work on and get those to you next week as well. And just sharing with our, our board members, you know, this is staff time and they're really trying to get it done so that we can be, um, get our answers, the answers to our questions. So try to be specific about your questions so that you, you actually get the response that you were hoping for. And if it's not really, but if it's just, I wonder, maybe save that for a uh, one-on-one -on -one conversation because then that just clogs up the, the work in trying to get this done in a, in a timely manner. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Silvestri, for um, alluding to that. And, and today was a perfect example. Some of the recommendations, thoughts, and reflections may even come out in committee meetings. Um, and the goal is that we continue this conversation beyond understanding the investment, but then how do we go to fidelity of implementation, which we all need to be involved in. I do want to um, thank um, Mr. Riley and Mr. Hall. Um, Last year, I know, Ms. Silvestri, we talked about the turnaround in terms of the, the answer to the questions, because this is really a quick process. Mm -hmm. We really have from like the second week in January until the end of the month to engage in all of these discussions. So they have committed to being able to, I think this is the quickest turnaround that you would have gotten right. yet. Um, the, the, the turnaround of the responses, as Mr. Hall just outlined, the expectation is that you get it within a week or less in these circumstances. So we're doing that because we want you to have a good foundation and the answers to your questions because it may be building on something else that we're presenting or something else that you may hear from a hearing. So I want to thank you, um, Mr. Hall. I know he came, you know, he definitely said we want to get these quickly and report it to me on Monday. <laughs> we're ready to send in, you know, doing a, a final review but sending the responses over to the board. So anything else that we can do to help in the process like that, please let us know. So Thank to you. Um, add to your list, I do have two follow-ups that I didn't get to ask Ms. Hazel, so I'll just <laughs> say them out loud and hope to see the responses in writing and discussion at our next work session. And again, I'm at the broken record about literacy and math improvement, right? Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see if, um, if I'm a teacher and I have a classroom of second or third graders that are not reading at the level that we want them to read. Do we give those teachers any additional support in order to equity, right? So if I have two students that are struggling versus I have 20 students that are struggling, do those teachers get any additional support? And where is that reflected in the budget? And then um, the same question I've been asking the whole time. What are we doing to improve math and literacy? Keep it simple. I don't, I, I don't want to guess and say, oh, I think this is it, I think this is it, I think it's every, in every slide. No, I need you to tell me what are we doing to improve math and literacy and what are we doing differently, right? Because if we keep doing the same things and we're not seeing the results, then we have a problem. And so if, if you could just help me um, understand that better because I really want to finish this budget work session process being able to uh, to understand that fully and to communicate that to the community. Thank you. So if there are no other, um, Ms. Evans. So no questions. Mine is just um, a thank you to the budget um, team. You know, I can't do that enough. We can't do that enough because today we just went through chapters two through six and um, 
everybody's come up here to present. Mr. Riley responds because he knows their budget. If we ask a question to um, the team in the, in the audience, Yvonne can yell out a number. I mean, they have it all down. So I just want to say thank you all for all the work um, that's done and also for following up with us really quickly. Just appreciate that. And I don't think the viewers know, but we were here last night to almost 10 o'clock. <laughs> so <laughs> um, just late nights to come with all this. That's all I wanted to say. Ms. Yang? I want to concur what Ms. Evan uh, just said. This is my first budget process, and so far um, I find it uh, really helpful that the staff present clearly, and when we have questions, uh, we, uh, I find that um, the answers are, are quick, and then whatever I need to bring back sounds like have a good system of a timeline to bring information back. So really appreciate everyone's work. And I just want to echo that as well and say, you know, our operating staff, our budget staff, finance staff do amazing work year in and year out. So, you know, coming attractions, as um, Ms. Silvestri is very good at, at highlighting for us, you don't want to miss our January 30th fiscal management committee meeting. What's the topic? 10 a.m. Oh, we're going to be talking about, we're going to... I can let Mr. Riley give you a couple of coming attractions for that if he wants to. No, just real quick, what, what are we going to see? It, all things finance. Um, so. <laughs> it's going to be great. Finance, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, so we do, like, like uh, Ms. Harris mentioned before, we'll give updates on various projects like the HCM project. Um, we'll look at our audit results. We'll look at things that affect our, you know, all the different departments um, within finance. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And that concludes our budget work session for today. Thank you so much, everyone.